Our brains got bigger when our guts got smaller. To be a successful vegan, you have to have a microbiome that's really exceptionally good at extracting nutrition from that diet. When you take antibiotics, it makes the microbiome more efficient at extracting nutrients from the food you eat. When you look at the trajectory of America, with the introduction of antibiotics, we became bigger, but also it changed the gut of our population. What's the deal with uh, EMF? What people need to be paying attention to more is radio frequencies. The RF that's around us is changing our microbiome. There's studies on rodents where they put a cell phone underneath the tank. The male rodents lost the ability to produce testosterone. And we're carrying this radiation device all the time. The best way to improve your microbiome is find a girl who you know is healthy and then lick her ass. Yes! Kratom gummies. All right, what's going on with big asses? <laughs> so there's a lot of girls who strive to have big asses now, right? Because yes. it's the thing. But what they don't realize is the guys that they attract want to do stuff to their asses. Oh. And then they're like, what? You want to stick what, what? And it's like, <laughs> it's like, it, it, it's almost like, um, imagine a hummingbird sees this beautiful flower <laughs> and thinks, oh, I'm going to stick my beak in. And then the flower goes, get the fuck out of here. It's like, <laughs> what are you doing? Why, why be a beautiful flower if you don't want me to stick my beak in you? Don't be mad when I want to eat that thing. There you, <laughs> go. you made it. There you go. You know? Listen, God. I, I had a theory. Well, and then the pants, like, you know, it, it <laughs> makes it even more attractive. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah they, like, they, hold it up and everything? <laughs> yeah, exactly. God damn. Yes. Booty scrunch. Uh, one time, <laughs> one time, one of the first times I met Joel Green, we were talking about the microbiome. I said, the best way to improve your microbiome is find a girl who you know is healthy and then lick her ass. Yes! <laughs> and he's like, he goes to me, he goes, that's actually brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And there's a legitimacy behind that because we have someone on that's talking about reviewed the... studies. Yeah. Yeah. You know the poop pills? Who oh, came yes. on and talked yeah. about those? Yes. Yeah. De de dehydrated poop, mm -hmm. enterically coated, so it gets down into the right area of the intestines and it opens up. Is isn't that the same thing of like, if you have a girl that you love and she's clean, and she's healthy, and she's not vegan. <laughs> like my girl loves ground beef. That's why I love go. her. There you go. There you go, man. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I, I can see how that could be helpful. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. How about that story uh, my wife shared with you about uh, Lachlan at Ron Penna's house? <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> Blowing up his bathroom because he ate too many uh, like protein, high protein gummy things gummies or some yeah. shit like right. that. Yeah. That can be that can be so brutal. I'm a big proponent of no no uh, fiber in the diet. Really? So we have research on people who had uh, G what is it G N Y Y bypass surgery. So they have to eat a low residue diet, no pro no no fiber, and other than potential uh, vitamin deficiencies, they have no problems without fiber in their diet. Mm. And so when you when you look at that and you start thinking and actually. Leslie Aiello, who was the uh, the chairperson of the Wenner Gren Foundation, which is the, the leading author, uh, anthropological organization in America there in Manhattan. I was lucky enough to have a couple conversations with her early on when I started the podcast. And the two things she said to me was, and she wrote an article that went around the internet forever, that uh, our brains got bigger when our guts got smaller. Mm. And the body only has a certain amount of energy. So what does it want to grow? But back in the day when we were eating, you know, grub worms and bark off of trees and shit, we basically had to eat all day long to, to, to get all the nutrition we needed. But once we started to eat animals, the body had nutrient-dense sources now. So the brain got bigger because the gut got smaller. The gut didn't have to be a factory anymore. Hmm. And she said, no one should be eating high fiber because it, it, we've evolved out of that. If we go back to Australopithecus gracile, and Australopithecus robustus, we see the diversion of, oh yeah, there you go. You found it, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, we, we see, we see the, the divergence of a, a purely vegan ancestor mm -hmm. who had a very short lifespan to an, an ancestor who started eating meat mm. and had a longer lifespan. What about maybe just some fiber, just for food volume, just for being well, like hungry? There, there's, yeah, just... there's naturally occurring fiber in a lot of things, um, but I don't believe we need fiber now. Joel Green will will intellectually argue with me, yeah, and I wouldn't debate him because you know the the other thing that we have to realize is there's a lot of ways to skin a fucking cat. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of ways to thrive. There's a lot of diets that will work, and in fact, the reason they work so well is because of the uniqueness 
of each and every one of us and our microbiome. So like to, to be a successful vegan, you have to have a microbiome that's really exceptionally good at extracting the, the elements of nutrition from that diet. A lot of people can't do it. That's why a lot of people try it. I think Robert Downey just tried it. And he looked like, he looked like a caricature. He lost so much weight and he had to stop. He a did. lot of people get wow. really gassy from like having vegetables and stuff. And I think that that is interesting. It's a thing that maybe, maybe people should explore that a little bit. Like, why is that food so offensive to your body? Right. Like, I'm not saying that you should go out of your way to eat a lot of it, but maybe your body should have the ability to eat some of it. Right. Like maybe it's, uh, maybe it's it messed a, up in a way, I guess. No, it, we, we, look, the reason we're apex predators is because we're hybrids. I mean, we could eat a lot of stuff and survive, not necessarily thrive, mm -hmm. but we could get by eating a lot of stuff and we're not going to just 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 fall off uh, the earth. For, yeah, look at that. Look at him now. Yeah. That's Is that so a picture sad. of David Weck on the right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to do David like that, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it does, though. <laughs> it does look like David. <laughs> yeah, he says, uh, Cole, I tried to go all in on vegan or on vegetarian, even vegan, but it just doesn't work for me, is what he says. Mm. Damn. Good. Well, hopefully Iron Man comes back. What are your thoughts on like the Blue Zones? Because right now on Netflix, there was the twin experiment where, you know, they're pushing uh, plant-based diets. Of course. And there's the Blue Zone show too, where they're pushing plant-based diets. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, when you really dig deeper on the Chinese, they eat a lot more beef than, they, and, and, and the Okinawans too. They eat a lot of beef. They don't, you know, they, do. they eat a lot of seafood. They smoke. You know, one, one of the things that he, he ignored is like he didn't show any Okinawan smoking. Like 90% of the population smokes tobacco. It's like, wait a minute, isn't that supposed to kill you? Interesting. Oh, maybe yeah. Maybe it's for a uh, hormesis. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> uh, but, but the real thing that he neglects is small people live longer, first of all. And mm -hmm. all the populations he's focused on are still fairly, fairly primitive. Why do you think smaller people live longer? What's your thoughts and theory? Wear on and that? tear. You know, uh, hot rods thousand horsepower, you're rebuilding the engine every three years, right? So smaller people live longer to, to begin with. And there's a really great book called Missing Microbes. I can't think of the author's name. I interviewed him probably five, six years ago. But he talks about the introduction of antibiotics and how it changed the size of humans in the United States. Because when you take antibiotics, it makes the microbiome more efficient at extracting nutrients from the food you you eat. Wow. That's why they give antibiotics to cows to make them fat, bigger, fatter, and stronger, like uh, uh, faster. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the trajectory of America with the introduction of antibiotics and especially the widespread prescription, like, oh, my kid has a hangnail. Well, here, take these antibiotics. We became bigger, but also it changed the, the gut of, of our population. When you look at the people in the blue zone, they're fairly close to primitive still. I mean, they're hunter-gatherers with really fancy huts. Like, they have houses now and, and Wi-Fi, right? They don't have Wi-Fi, but you get my point. But we're really, at the end of the day, they're primitive. You can't compare them to us. We can't do what they do and magically live longer. It's not about the food. It's about everything. They go to sleep when the sun goes down. Yeah. You know, the Italian villages, they're walking uphill all day long. Like, and, and plus, we neglect air quality. You know, we know that people who live closer to major highways have a much higher rate of heart disease. And the further out you go, it gets lower and lower. So we breathe crap yeah. and it gets stored in our cells. Mm. That's what, it, 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 like I was talking before about my theory of aging is the metabolic accumulation of debris. Our body doesn't know what 60 fucking years old is, but it does know that over 60 years, if you're the average American, you've come in contact with all these things every single day and you accumulate that shit in your body. They're saying that Americans now spend about 90% of their time inside. That's oh. pretty wild. I think in other cultures, it's, uh, it's, it's more uh, communal and universal to go outside and to walk. And I think in areas like Greece, um, they have like, the whole middle of the day is like to take like a nap and right. like go home and hang out and relax and, and all those kinds of things. Well, let's look at the French, French paradox. They walk to the restaurant, they eat, they walk home. So is it the food or is it the fact that they walk to and from the fucking restaurant? We know, we know that walking after a meal yeah. 
lowers postprandial blood sugar dramatically, better than metformin. So like they're fucking, they're walking everywhere. Uh, my friend Adele Musa, he lives in Munster, Germany. He rides a bike everywhere. Like they are super healthy because of their fucking lifestyle. And we're not willing to give up the bus and Tesla and, and everything like that. We're just DoorDash. not willing to do it. And they're healthy despite, you know, you, when you go to these other countries, you see them drinking all the time. Like, like literally all the time. They drink all day. Right. And you see them smoking cigarettes all day. I mean, I don't know if that's like the tourists or I don't know if that's the people no. that are native to there yeah. or, or what the deal is, but you see them doing that and uh, none of them are fat. And that's why I've said over and over again that you've done more for anti-aging than any of the gurus out there who pr promote to be all about anti-aging. You know, there's some people out there that claim that they know about anti-aging. And it's about taking this pill to resume, remove zombie cells. Or it's take this and take that. Oh, I'm going to live to be 160, 180. There's a guy out there. I'm not going to mention his name and even give him any publicity. But this is such bullshit. The, the, key to, the key to longevity is moving all fucking day long. That's, what he, that's all he proposes. Lift weights, train, walk, run. And he's, he's like the man in motion. That's what he is. And that's why if people follow him and they go... You know, I'm going to try that today. I'm going to walk for 10 minutes three times a day, which is where you started with a lot of that stuff. You know, I'm re heavy resistance training. One 40-minute session will eliminate 80% of the senes senescent cells from muscle tissue. Most of the senescent cells we have are in muscle tissue. And, and Give tissue. us a little baby talk. What's a senescent cell? The zombie cells that everybody's talking about. Mm -hmm. They're cells that live past the expiration date. And they spin off a lot of inflammatory cytokines that poison all the cells around them, and they they cause us to age. So get in the gym and train for 40 minutes uh, three times a week, and you'll do more for senescent cells than taking all these fucking pills. And by the way, if you really want to get rid of senescent cells, get your doctor to write a prescription for a z pack because the z pack zithromycin, has been approved by the FDA as a senolytic, one five-day uh, Z-pack will remove 90% of the senescent cells in your entire fucking body. So before you buy the magic, you know, pill, the magic bean from the new guy who's promoting it, think about that. Just go get a fuck, go get a, a, a prescription once a, once a year. That's it. Mm -hmm. Bam. All the senescent cells are gone in five days. But doesn't a, a Z-Pack, won't that like just kind of destroy everything? No, the interesting thing about Z-Pack is it doesn't act like an antibiotic. Mm. In fact, the, the reason Z-Pack worked, so a lot of doctors were told, don't pres prescribe Z-Packs for the, the recent uh, the pandemic. Thing, yeah, yeah. I don't want to mention any words, you know. Thank you. Mm. I think we're good, yeah. Mm. It's, I, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, so the reason a Z-Pack worked was discovered, discovered on that boat. Um, that, that was out at, that's kept out at the sea. Mm. Um, so there was a guy who was a, a kidney recipient and he was taking rapamycin every day and rapamycin will get rid of senescent cells as well. His wife got COVID. He got COVID. He was sick for one day. His wife had to stay on the boat for like three, four, five weeks before she could recover. Mm. So now we, we had to see what, what was it about this guy? And we go, oh, well, he's a kidney recipient. He should die. He's like, he's, he's got organs that don't belong in his body and he gets this virus. Why didn't he fucking die? Then they started looking at what rapamycin does. And what rapamycin does is it eliminates the accumulation of senescent cells in your body. So fast forward, zithromycin does the same thing in five days. That's why most people who had really bad COVID, if they got one or two Z-packs, they got better like, like so, so fast because... COVID is a retrovirus. It requires reverse transcriptase, an enzyme, and it re requires a senescent cell as the factory. The older you are, the more senescent cells you have. Mm -hmm. More factories you have spinning off viruses. Viral load goes through the roof quickly. You get rid of those factories, you don't have the virus any longer. There's no place for it to replicate. Mm -hmm. So things that remove senescent cells that really do, not magic beans, like uh, uh, rapamycin, Zithromycin. So what they discovered was zithromycin is a horrible antibiotic, but it works by, by, by culling the body of its senescent cells. And when you do that, no matter what 
you're sick from. The body can fight it because the body is fighting these senescent cells all day long. That's where we, we could talk about uh, chronic uh, inflammation. Uh, those senescent cells cause chronic inflammation. There's all these little fires burning all the time. You get rid of those and the immune system goes, holy fuck, we have resources now to go fix this and go fix that. How do you know so much of this shit? <laughs> I just make it up, man. If you believe it, I'm good with it. <laughs> 18 years of podcasting, superhuman radio, right? Yeah. yeah. How did I mean, that start? Like, and, and there wasn't any podcast back then, was there? Oh, no, yeah. 2005, I started doing that podcast. There wasn't even the know. internet, barely. <laughs> no, I, I was on AM radio when I started yeah. doing it. I was on AM radio. Uh, and I recorded 30, my shows. 3,200 3, shows. Yeah. yeah. Holy shit. God. And most of them were two and three hours long. Wow. Where'd this start from? Did you have your own I was health fucking issues? dying. I was dying. I had a heart problem. I was 330 pounds. Oh, twins. <laughs> <laughs> 330. The 330 club. <laughs> I did 330 club. Yeah. That's good. Uh, but I was sick. I, I de developed a heart problem. My, my heart wouldn't beat straight any longer. I had healthy parents. I was a fat fuck. In fact, I still have my membership card somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, I, I literally was killing myself. And then I, I got sick. I had to sell my company. I had an alarm company. I was very sick. My heart, they were talking about putting a pacemaker in me. I was 39 years old. Wow. And so uh, my ex-wife bought me a book called The Ageless Beauty, Timeless Mind by Deepak Chopra. I couldn't tell you anything about the book except the one passage that gave me hope. It said every cell in the body is reproduced from six weeks to six months, depending on what kind of tissue it is. And so I thought, okay, I've got some broken parts in my heart, but they're going to get replaced. What do I do to make sure they're replaced with healthy parts? Mm -hmm. And so I started digging around and I found out that two things cause the greatest amount of cardiac remodeling. And first of all, you have to differentiate between the term, um, uh, I just forgot what I was going to say. Uh, it's, it's, so, so th there's, How about remodeling of the heart? Well, yeah. So, so there's pathological and physiological changes in the heart. Okay. The medical orthodoxy looks at physiological changes like pathological. Like you squat heavy, your heart gets big and strong. You sit on a chair all day long and never move, your heart gets big and weak. So they go, oh, you have a cardio enlargement, cardiomyopathy. And really you don't because you're lifting weights and your heart's getting stronger. So I read studies about that, and I was like, oh, lifting weights. And then the other thing I read about was anabolic steroids. <laughs> they, they had the Bulgarian weightlifters who were lifting and juicing and lifting and juicing, and they had big hearts, and then they stopped juicing, and they stopped lifting, their hearts went back to normal. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, so I can kind of give my heart a bump. And back then, we had a lot of designer products, you know, uh, the, the uh, pro hormones and shit like that. Mm -hmm. I just started lifting weights and doing and and doing some of these uh, pro hormones, and uh, I remember my doctor Jim Swift, nice guy, really good guy, but <clears throat> he didn't get it. I said, "Look, I'm going to become a power lifter." Now you got to remember, I'm like a slightly lighter 330 pound guy sitting on the fucking on the the exam table. He goes, uh, "You have life insurance?" <laughs> I said, "Actually, I do." He says, "Well, make sure it's paid up because your wife and children are going to have to depend on that." Damn. Yeah, but I didn't give a fuck. I didn't give a fuck. And that's, that, that, my journey became, I've, I've actually ranted about this. I didn't care about getting thin. I cared about getting strong. I focused on strength gains. So every week I had fucking wins. Every month I had wins. Added reps, added weight. New, you know, I remember the first time I did good mornings. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, oh, this is a fucking great movement. I loved it. I just felt powerful. And yeah. all I focused on was getting strong. And I did. I got stronger than I ever thought I would. Um, but that is what saved my life because it changed my heart from a weak, malfunctioning heart to a really powerful pump. Why do you think other people should uh, chase after strength mainly? Because you mentioned the same thing last night. Because we have, people give up because they don't see progress. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're, oh, I'm going to go on a Zempic which I think is a bad idea. And I, I know there are a lot of people that will debate me about it. Yeah, let's come back to that. Oh, yeah, bit. look at that. There, you there I am. So I actually, yeah, that, I that was, that, that was the, the day of my 50th birthday. Wow. <laughs> yep. There it is. Awesome. The guy on the, on the left died. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but really, um, the dates are wrong, I think. But anyway, um, 
the, the, like a lot of people in, into Ozempic right now because they want progress fast. They mm -hmm. want to be guaranteed progress. So people have to be able to, to track progress. The easiest thing to track progress, I don't care if you're a fat fuck. <clears throat> wow, I just squatted 10 pounds more than I did last week. That's a win. So you have these small week, daily and weekly wins that lead into annual changes in your, your body. I think training for strength is all, excuse me, can you get that out, Andrew? Like, <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. You're good. Um, <laughs> not sure if it was the weed or the crater. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody should know I smoked weed before the interview today. <laughs> you can't tell them anything else. Don't tell them anything else. Um, but uh, <laughs> the, the, but uh, what I was going to say was, um, uh, what was I going to say? There's the weed. <laughs> <laughs> about uh, the incremental gains that you make yeah. every week or so. Right. And when That's you're looking important. in the mirror and you, if you're, you know, looking at your gut or something and you're like, man, I'm, that's just a, it takes a long time, right? Yes. It takes a lot, especially like someone has like a troubled area that they hate about themselves and they see that and they want to make progress on that. That can happen, but it's going to take a long time. Right. To gain five pounds or to be able to do an extra rep sometimes only takes a week or two. Right. And the other thing is your body is repartitioning. Like you're gaining muscle literally from your first workout and you're losing fat and you go on the scale and you go, fuck, I haven't lost any weight. Well, you probably lost some fat and it was replaced with muscle. And that's more important because muscle is metabolic currency. Mm -hmm. And when you go into gym, you're training to, to make a deposit into that bank account. You want to get stronger. You want to add muscle. Fuck the fat. It doesn't matter. Don't even think about that. Yeah. Just get stronger. And at the end of your journey, you will look different. But you if you don't have, focus on that. You can have body fat. Yeah. Right? I mean, we can have... What, what do you think? I mean... It's not probably good to to get too much into like what's the how fat can someone be, but how fat ish do you think someone can be and still be very healthy? <laughs> I don't think I, so. I disagree with that one, right? Uh, I think that uh, it, it's like this. I'm just saying, like you know, someone could probably be twenty, like a male, oh, could be yeah, twenty you, you percent be, body yeah, fat, yeah, you could, I and think, be very, very healthy. I think the the uh, the obsession with uh, single digit body fat is just as bad as being obese. Mm. Uh, you know, we need fat. It's, it's important for us to have it when we get sick and we're in bed for a week with, you know, it's your fat stores that keep you going. True. So, but I, I, the one thing I disagree with is these oh, really obese people mm. that are going like, well, I'm healthy. My blood pressure is fine and my blood sugar is fine. And don't forget the doctor just says your blood sugar is fine. He doesn't say you're creeping up like in a year you'll be pre-diabetic. They don't yeah. tell they, oh, it's fine. So the analogy I use is if I jump off a hundred story building, I'm still alive at the 60th floor, right? I'm good. But I am going to hit the fucking ground and splash, yeah, yeah. right? So don't tell me that you're fine because you're, you're 150 pounds overweight, but your doctor says you're fine. That's bullshit. Your doctor doesn't know anything. Your doctor doesn't go off. His smoke detector doesn't turn on until the minute you're sick. Mm. And the goal is not to get sick in the first place. Mm. When you were moving from 3.30 and you, you got in really good shape, you mentioned it, it took a while. So what was the process of you, because you gained muscle, I mean, you, you, you were in much better shape. What were all the things that you were doing in terms of the habits you were building? Oh my God, I fixed my sleep. Like my kids used to say, Shh, be quiet, dad's in his apartment. I used to put the eye covers on, the earplugs in, because I went to, I got up with the kids in the morning at five o'clock and yeah. I, I got them ready for school. I breakfast, lunch, and I let my wife sleep in. Because she stayed up later at night because I went to bed at fucking nine. Like, I didn't give a shit. Oh, the you dog did. the dog ran away. We can't find him. Fuck it. I'll look tomorrow morning. Like, I, I got to go to sleep now. And I know that was probably a kind of asshole move. But I had to become militant to save my own life. Mm. And I'm actually there again now, by the way, uh, for other reasons. But you must become militant. If you want to change your outcome... You can't fucking do it with one foot in the boat and one foot out. You got to get in the boat and say goodbye to everybody at the dock and go. And so I went to sleep at nine o'clock every night. I started using melatonin to get deeper sleep. Uh, I changed the way I ate. When I woke up in the morning, the first thing I did was shower and then eat. Because eating is a, is a biological clock trigger. Just like the sun rising, the first meal tells you, your body, mm -hmm. well, we're up, we're up, we're going to be doing things, get ready. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing I'd do is I'd eat, and I'd eat like, uh, I had egg whites and oatmeal, you know, traditional bodybuilder stuff. Wow. Um, <laughs> I trained first thing in the morning, dropped the kids off at school, went to the gym and trained, came home. This, I didn't realize it, but out of Michael Hearn's book, who I, I have a lot of respect for, I like Mike a lot. The only person. 
<laughs> the only person to respect Michael Hearn. No. We're just kidding. We're just but kidding. you know, no, no, you know, Mike, Mike is a big proponent. Oh, love he trains at four. Absolutely. He comes home and eats, and then he goes to sleep. Mm-hmm. He does. And when you think about the the big predator animals, what do they do after they chase a fucking animal and eat it? They go lay down on the tree and they take a nap. Yeah. Rest and digest. So. And this drove my ex-wife crazy. I'd come home from the gym because I, I worked from home. I was outside sales rep for a company at that time. Mm-hmm. And I would fucking eat and I'd go on the sofa and I'd take a nap. And I, I know she felt like I was being derelict of my duties, but I was saving my life. Mm. I, and I know she didn't like the person I became because she actually told me one time, I liked you better when you were fat. And I said, but I'd be fucking dead. Okay, wait, so why do you know why she said that? Did you ever ask her like, what do you mean no, by that? No, because because I I I embarked on this journey that was vastly different than the life we had, mm. and she felt like I be I wasn't fun anymore because I was I was militant. I I have to eat at this time. I can't eat what you're cooking for the kids tonight. I'll make my own food. Like she, I stopped drinking coffee because <clears throat> coffee was jacking up my stomach. Um, I didn't drink alcohol for a decade. Like that was big for me because, you know, alcohol was part of my life. Mm. And so she didn't like that person. She didn't marry that guy. I get it. You know, but what's the choice? I make you happy and I fucking die younger or I get on this fucking boat, push off from the dock and wait goodbye to you. It's why you got divorced probably too, right? Yeah, had a, lot to, had a lot to do with it. Yeah. I think a lot of people go through that. We talk about that quite a bit on the show. Like somebody's like, oh, fuck, you know, the person's getting away from me or they're changing. And is that sort of what happened? Yes, definitely. And, and the funny thing is we had one um, session, like when we were going to get divorced. So she picked a, a therapist and we went. And we told our stories. So my ex-wife got to talk first. And what she talked about was all the shit that I was doing wrong. And then I got to talk and I talked about this epiphany, this life epiphany that I had. <clears throat> and she, at the end of the meeting, she summed it up like this. She said... I see what happened. He got younger and you don't like it. That's exactly what she said. And I'll never forget my ex-wife said, fuck this. And she was, <laughs> and I wrote a check. And that was it. Yeah. Let me ask you this real quick. Um, the coffee thing. Do you drink coffee? Does it still fuck with your stomach? I'm or? stopping. I'm, uh, after this weekend, I'm not doing it anymore. See, see, I wake up in the morning and I feel like I need coffee, but it doesn't do anything for me anymore. And I'll tell you why. Okay. <clears throat> when I started tra- training like a power lifter, I never call myself a powerlifter. I don't deserve the respect that powerlifters have. But I trained, I trained like one. Hey, if you do the big three, you're <clears throat> yeah. a powerlifter. Yep. I was like a vegan the first time I squatted 405. I would tell people that doesn't even <laughs> fucking care. You know, I was at this skating rink picking up my daughter, and the, the moms are sitting around. I said, I just squatted 405 pounds. They're Four like, plates on each side. Yeah. Eight plates total. I, I know I was a dick, but I was I was excited. No belt. <laughs> Deep too. <laughs> you like that? <laughs> exactly. And then they just say, "Is that a lot?" You're oh like, yeah. Oh, 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 you only did it once. <laughs> oh, it's from oh, it's from one rep. They're like, "Oh, okay." Did you put the bar up over your head? <laughs> yeah. Like, Not, oh, I'm okay. an Olympic lifter. Yeah. <laughs> Do you sing? Yes. What was I saying? Coffee. Coffee. Oh, so <laughs> I I started doing 300 milligrams of caffeine and hydrus before my workout. Right after I dropped the kids off at school, I trained, and then I did another three. And I was still able to take a nap when I went home. Woo. So I've abused, <laughs> I've abused caffeine for so long. Like there were days where I would do a thousand milligrams of between caffeine, coffee, or energy drinks mm-hmm. before, before a show. And my show was at one o'clock in the afternoon. And so what I theorized happened was uh, adenosine receptors in the brain, they, they increase to because the adenosine is what you're blocking with the caffeine and the caffeine and the brain's going, well, you got all this fucking caffeine. We need more adenosine receptors. So now I have a form of chronic fatigue. And if I have coffee, it makes me fucking tired. Mm. And so I, I'm I'm done with caffeine for now. I don't mm-hmm. know if I'll use it again, but I'm I'm done with it for now. And plus it jacks up my stomach bad. I've had people reach out to me. <clears throat> what peptide is good for GERD? you know, uh, gastro yeah. reflux. Right. <clears throat> I said, no peptide. You drink coffee? Yeah. Stop drinking coffee. Literally, two weeks later, my GERD went away. It's like coffee is fucking garbage at the end of the day. I know we want that <laughs> that 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 rush that caffeine gives us, mm-hmm. but there, there's better ways to get it. I find Kratom, low doses, micro doses of Kratom will give me that energy. In fact, 
The reason I'm so talkative right now is because that Kratom kicked in and I feel fucking great. <laughs> yeah, that gummy hit me too, man. I like it. I yeah, like it. Um, Carl likes using the uh, Mind Bullet tea. Yes, like I drink it tea, in the morning. The yeah. tea packets. Instead of coffee. Do you think that caffeine, um, I guess maybe coffee in particular, do you think that these things are, or just caffeine in general, do you think these things are problematic? I think they're very different, caffeine and coffee. Ca coffee has problems that caffeine doesn't have. But yes, I think we become too dependent. In fact, this is just a study that was published that if you have one energy drink a month, it jacks your sleep up for the entire month. Hmm? Shit. I'll send it to you. So I, I, I am so curious about that. Yeah, that's, that's insane. So I, I think that <clears throat> caffeine may have been the worst thing in the world to be introduced into the population. Benjamin Franklin once said <clears throat> that ca caffeine, I'm paraphrasing, uh, caffeine is amazing because it allows us to ignore sunset and continue to work. Oh, wow. Now think about that from a standpoint of That's like how crazy. important how important sleep is, right? Yeah. So what is caffeine really good for? It's good for fucking your sleep up. And we know there's a, a melu of problems that come with fucked up sleep. Mm -hmm. And just because you lay in bed for eight hours doesn't mean you have good sleep architecture. This is true. Because if that was true, I could hit you in the head with a bat and you'd wake up later and go, man, that was the fucking best rest <laughs> I ever had. Yeah. I know uh, you're not a huge fan of like necessarily tracking stuff because you and I have talked before. We don't really think they're all that accurate and stuff like that. But I know Ensema's had, he's kind of checking his HRV and noticed some improvements from not having coffee. Do you think that even just some coffee in the morning, do you think it can mess with someone's sleep at night? I think coffee is way more detrimental than we're going to find out in our lifetime because there's big money behind coffee. Yeah, big fucking. I mean, there's a Starbucks in every fucking. Yeah, car. do you do you buy all the benefits of coffee? Where no. they're like, oh, it's got no. this and that and that. And then big... so I happen to know that that you you've stopped drinking alcohol, which I think is one of the wisest things we can do, because I drink alcohol because it changes my state of mind and I like the buzz. But I am not foolish enough to try to convince myself that it's good for me. Because if it's fucking good for you, give it to your dog. <laughs> give, give, it, give it to your baby. Why not put some in the baby bottle? Give it, give it to your baby. Which, by the way, my grandfather did give me wine when he babysat for me. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Calm you down. Yeah. He's like, he doesn't know. He gets to just smoke a cigar. And my jail. mother, my mother smoked cigarettes and took benzos when she was pregnant with me. Jesus. The fact that I can fucking form sentences is, <laughs> is, is quite, a, quite a big deal for me. You know? <laughs> it's incredible. So, uh, where'd you grow up? Brooklyn, New York, Bedford Stuyvesant. So those of you who are fans of Jay-Z, he sings about the Mossy Projects. I grew up around the corner from the Mossy Projects. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. where Biggie's from too, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was, yeah. How did some of that shape you, do you think? Um, hmm. Well. Did you always have to be like on high alert, you know, no, shit like that? Uh, or no, was it not, was I, it safe? I, ha I had a father who was a wonderful man, a hardworking truck driver, but he was feared in the neighborhood. Um, he hung out with some real rough guys at like a, uh, by the Brooklyn Navy Yard, Navy Yard there used to be a, a bar called Anselmo's, they, they, but they nicknamed it the, the Madhouse. Like it's not the kind of bar you just walk in for a drink. And uh, my father was a really, really rough guy, but a lot of people in the neighborhood knew him. And I really think that he was like my golem. Like people didn't, he didn't have to stand behind me, but they knew like, you know, yeah. But uh, I was roughed around. The, my saving grace was my humor. I, I was beat up a lot when I was really young because there were a lot of thuggish kids in the neighborhood. But then I made friends and I was funny and they liked me because I was funny. So it was cool. Like I entertained them and I didn't get my ass kicked. <laughs> and it, it worked out good. But uh, I think I, I do have uh, a fear component that's always turned on in me. Uh, it's funny. So I go down rabbit holes for the stupidest reasons. So a couple nights ago, I was in Vegas with my wife, Elisa, and we're going to sleep. And I, I like to sleep on my left side. And so I, I got myself into that fetal position. And, and I just naturally take the arch of my right foot and put it on the instep of my left foot. And so that triggered a thought. And I said, I wonder if that's how I like hung out in my mother's womb. Mm. That's why it like, just goes there. Yeah. And then I started to think, I know that my mother, uh, when she was pregnant with me, there was lots of problems. Mm. And so, like, when, when a woman builds a baby in her womb, she builds the idle speed. So baby has no vocabulary, only pure emotion. And if your mother's always worried that your father drinks too much and may beat her up and all that shit, 
then you feel those feelings. You don't have a vocabulary to say, oh, it's just my mother worried, but you have the fear and fear becomes your, your, your idol. There's science to back that up. I've heard uh, Robert Sapolsky talk about that before. It's super interesting. Yeah. But that, that's the rabbit hole I went down the other yeah. night just because I put my <laughs> arch of my right yeah. foot over my left. But yeah, I, I think that uh, I had a fear component and it was it was justified because the neighborhood I I lived in was really bad. Like I, ha I had a friend who was killed, like murdered. He was probably uh, about eight or nine years older than me. But I remember like my parents talking about it. And I had a guy who committed suicide in the uh, in the hallway of the house next to me. Oh, nice. And and we had gangs. We had real gangs back then. Um, so yeah, it, I I think I I had that fear component all the time, which is probably a good thing if you're a hunter gatherer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your, your antenna is always on. Was yeah, it like your... the mob and stuff back then too? Right. Well, was... that's when I moved to Queens. I actually lived uh, on 110th Street and 101st Avenue, and John Gotti's club mm. was on 99th Street and 101st Avenue. And like when I watch videos of Sammy the Bull, like he was always the sharpest dressed guy of the neighborhood. And I, I was just a kid in the neighborhood. So I, I had no competition with them. They were always very nice to me. Uh, I used to see John and his brother, G Eugene, and another guy, uh, Tony. They would walk on the other side of 100, uh, 101st Avenue across <laughs> the street from the bar that I hung out. Mm -hmm. And we would always say, hey, John. And he was always nice. Hey, how you guys doing? It's a nice summer night. And that was it. So yeah, I, I I grew up in that element, but I I didn't feel comfortable in. It. I have a lot of friends who went to that path. I have a couple of friends who are currently in the witness protection program, but I was never built for that because uh, just like I lived in Vegas and I didn't gamble, I, I'm not willing to to do something that's going to fuck the rest of my life up. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's just not worth it. So yeah, I think uh, you shared this with me. It was something that I think your dad told it to you, but it was about uh, the problems that. <laughs> one individual has, and, and can you describe that to these My guys? My father used really to say powerful. regularly when I would complain about something, he'd say, if everybody on the block threw their problems in the street and we all went out there to pick new problems, we'd come back with our own. <laughs> yeah. So, I just thought that's such a good visual, you know, yeah. you just picture like, yeah, I'll just keep my little problem. Yeah, not my as, friend, not yeah, as bad as what that guy's yeah. doing. Right. It's yeah. effective, man. You know, with, uh, so many people, like, for example, we just use some Kratom right here. Everyone's talking about their ayahuasca and their shroom <laughs> trips. What are your thoughts on that having, like, you know, you, you've you used drugs when you were younger, and now it's, like, in vogue? It was in vogue when I was a kid, too. Yeah? I mean, yeah, we, I mean, like, back in the day, you would show up at a party, and you wouldn't be ashamed to say, hey, I got an eight ball in my pocket. You know, everybody, yeah, let me do some blow. So, <laughs> in the 60s and 70s, it was all about doing drugs. I mean, I tripped more times than I care to acknowledge. Uh, I did a lot of acid. I liked acid. I liked speed. Um, in fact, just the way they have methadone clinics today, mm -hmm. back in the day, they had desoxin clinics. And this was for people who were addicted to meth. It was a little, little tablet. It was a plastic tablet with a yellow powdery coating on it. They would soak it and they'd, they'd have to drink it in front of them. And I had a friend named Joey TV that he would drink it in his mouth and then he'd take it out. So he got a little bit and then he would sell them to me for $5. And I worked at the racetrack at the, at the time and I had to be in my stalls at 4.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. And this is when I'm at like 17, because I dropped out of high school and I went to work at the racetrack. So I would soak it and leave it next to my bed. And I'd wake up at, at like 3.30 in the morning, I drink it, I go back to sleep, and all of a sudden I'd fucking wake up. I'd get on my Schwinn and I'd ride all the way to Aqueduct. And I used to do that morning after morning. Yeah, so I, I, li I like the ups. I didn't really like the, you know, everybody was doing quaaludes back then and shit. I, I like drugs that made you more talkative. Could you imagine? <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> my mother said I took one breath when I was a kid and I haven't stopped talking since. <laughs> When it comes to, uh, you know, the vast amount of different drugs that you know about, it seems like you have acquired a lot of knowledge about peptides. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what are some pepti peptides that you've taken, that you've liked, that you've noticed that it's done something? Like what? Because I, I don't know where I stand on even peptides because there's so many of them. It's hard to figure out what's what. I, I talked about peptides. In fact, I will tell you that there's two very big influencers in the peptide realm that learned about peptides originally from me in 2006. I did my first peptide show with Anthony Roberts, 
Uh, many of you may remember he wrote the book on anabolic steroids, uh, uh, the research guide. And we talked about uh, IGF-1, the first recombinant IGF-1, because before that it was pituitary derived from cadavers. Okay. Okay, so um, then that led to uh, GHRP6 was the second peptide I ever talked about on the show. Again, this is like in 2006. Wow. So I was talking about peptides before anybody knew. And today, everybody's a fucking peptide expert. Yeah. And I just sit back. I, I'm, I, I've shared this with you. I, I'm a little bit of a cunt. I, 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 feel like, I feel like I should have been fucking more successful with superhuman radio. Like a lot of these people... I'm not going to drop names because they're good people, but they do fucking shows that I did in 2008, 2010, and they're doing it now. And it's like, I'm thinking, they got fucking 3 million downloads of that. I got 50 fucking thousand. Like, where, well, why? Is, remember one time I said to you, I think people just don't like me. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's the case. <laughs> At this point, nasal breathing while you're asleep is no longer something that just us bros do, but people are realizing that it can make a big difference in your sleep quality, your recovery, and all aspects of sleep. That's why hostage tape is so important because many people have their mouths drop open while they're asleep, they're snoring, and that really affects the quality of their sleep. And that's why many wake up groggy and not feeling extremely rested. Hostage tape will allow you to tape your mouth shut even if you have a beard. Us bearded folks can put the tape on and can be confident enough that when you wake up in the morning, the tape will still be on your mouth, which will help you breathe through your nose. And they also have no strips if you're someone who struggles breathing through the nose. Those nose strips will help you open up your airway and breathe a little bit easier while you're asleep. How can they get their hands on some hostage tape? Yeah, you guys can head over to hostagetape.com slash power project where you guys can receive mouth tape and no strips for an entire year for less than a dollar a night. Again, hostagetape.com slash power project links down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. But it must feel, I mean, as much as it is annoying, it must feel good to know that you were ahead of the curve on a lot of different topics, not yeah. just the peptides thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, big time. Like, and still, I, I mean, I, I stopped doing this. So let me answer the, the question. I think the most valuable peptides right now are thymus and beta-4, uh, and not for the reason that people take it. Uh, if you do a large enough dose once a week, you can actually uh, trigger neonatal genes to turn back on and fix shit. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> and the research is out there. In fact, um, a premature, if, if you're going to deliver a preemie, if you take thymus and beta-4 for like the last couple months the baby is in you, mm -hmm. the baby will catch up by the time it comes yes. out. This, and this is all, this, this is backed by studies. This is not me like making shit up. Um, and, we, and we also know that the thymus and beta-4 uh, has influence on every fucking organ and the brain by flipping those neonatal genes and fixing shit. If you combine thymus and beta-4 with growth hormone and take it consistently one a bolus dose once a week with growth hormone just one or two i use a day for five days a week for a year you'll see changes in your body that you never thought you could have like what but fucking and this is, we're just talking guys or this organ. is not medical advice yeah right okay organs like damaged organs from from just living in general like they will repair you know we always hear people oh the body can repair itself yeah mm -hmm. it can but it needs a blueprint in order to get the blueprint, we have to turn neonatal genes on that formed you in your mother's womb. They already have the blueprint to fix your kidney, fix your heart. If you go for stem cell therapy and you take thymus and beta-4, the way I'm talking about, with, with it and a little growth hormone and maybe even a little red light therapy, you, I believe you can really fucking change your body. Wow. And you don't have to take magic beans. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is legit shit. <laughs> this is all science-based. Um, but that thymus and beta four, uh, and, and let me just inject July 10th of last year, I had a fucking stroke. So full disclosure, I like anabolic steroids <laughs> and, and, and occasionally I forget I'm 65 years old. And so, and believe me, when I die, if I die at 80, they're going to be like, oh, it's fucking anabolic steroids. <laughs> you know? But I was, uh, I was taking very high doses of a couple orals and I was taking a couple different injectables, and I ignored my blood pressure for way, way too long. Mm. So I had a stroke. And there are studies that show that after an ischemic event, cardiac or cerebral, stroke or heart attack, in six hours, within six hours, if you take 
uh, uh, the appropriate dose based on your weight for me is five milligrams. Within that time, it will repair everything. And you'll look like you never had the heart attack. There's no collateral damage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I was having the stroke while I was working. I said to Elisa, I says, I think I'm having a stroke. I, I can't, I'm typing, I'm texting, and my left fucking hand isn't, isn't working. And she says, well, you are, you're slurring your words. And she says, get up and take a shot of thymus and beta-4. So I took the shot. Over the next 15, 20 minutes, I became completely paralyzed on the left side of my body. I couldn't talk. My voice, voice changed. I couldn't move my arm. Move, move my, we called the ambulance. The ambulance put me in a, a wheelchair. They wheeled me out, put me in the ambulance, driving me to the hospital. And while he's driving me to the hospital, all of a sudden, I move my left arm. I'm like, I says, hey, I, I can move my left arm. He says, lift your left leg. I lifted it. He goes, well, you're not slurring your words anymore. So he says, oh, you must have had a TIA. It's a transient uh, uh, situation where the brain like runs out of fuel and your brain has like a fucking malfunction. Mm -hmm. And he says, yeah, because if you had a real stroke, you, you know, you wouldn't be better right now. I get into the hospital. He tells them, they say, oh, we, we're not going to give you the clock buster. And they set me up for an MRI. I went and did the MRI. They were like, wow, you had a fucking stroke. <laughs> Shit. I said, really? He's, and I'll never forget it. It was the, the, the neuro, neurological nurse. She said, uh, not only did you have an ischemic stroke, but there's blood. So you had a hemorrhagic as well. Like that type of a fucking stroke. They, they, everybody in the hospital told me, like, normally you're here for two months learning how to walk again. Mm. I walked out of that fucking hospital two days later. And I was in the, the gym the following day training. No one could believe it. I didn't tell anybody at the hospital because I was like, fuck, if my insurance company finds out, they may like bounce this fucking $80,000 mm -hmm. payment because I took some fucking drug. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's peptides really are can, can be magic. Can be magic. There, there's a lot here, but like you said that your wife was like, take some thymus and beta-4. So she do, does she in this stuff too? She well, no. Well, she, she's into it because of me. Mm -hmm. And she used to co-host, we used to do a, a show for a few years called Casual Friday where she'd actually do the show. I'd be Ed McMahon and she'd fucking do the whole show. Okay. Uh, just be like a sidekick. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, she, she's smart. She knows this shit. Wow. And she told me, take it now. I was like, well, let me just send this email because I'm raising money for gun leash. I got to get this email out because I'm trying to get this appointment. She goes, get up and fucking story. take it. Yeah. Oh, wow. So over the, uh, I mean, the, the whole catalog of all these interviews that you've done and you've been ahead of the game, you've, you've been first to a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that the first time you hear it is like, that's, that's gotta be bullshit, right? All right. Um, so how, like, how did, what was like the vetting process when somebody had something to say? Like, what did you do in order to like, okay, he, I, he's actually worth, you know, interviewing whatever the, the subject matter is. Cause I'm sure there were some people that had some information that you're like, oh, wait, that ended up being complete bullshit. Not many. Most okay. of them I didn't interview. Like, first of all, it, all of the research, all, all the interviews I did, like 80% of the interviews I did were with the authors of studies. And I and I read the studies and I, and I could compare and I could research the studies they were basing it on. And I could look at it and go, wow, this is fucking interesting. This is legit. Like Dr. S Dr. Samuel Denmead, who's curing aggressive prostate cancer by giving men testosterone. Right? Like mm -hmm. I had him on three times over the course of, I don't know, I think probably the first time six years ago, seven years ago. So I, I read these studies. And then when Elisa came into the picture, she started reading the studies. She's like, I think that you'd be interested in this. And she had good instincts. So I was like, okay. So I had her helping me. But like, there are things that I've talked about recently. Well, recently, like in the last two years that people are still not fucking up on yet. And, and I, and I want to mention them. So, Something that can actually reverse aging, and this is going on right here in San Francisco, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Arena and David Conboy, the Conboy Lab. They're the ones who did the original research on taking uh, blood from young rodents and putting it in old rodents and vice versa, and the old rodents got young, and uh, parabiosis, it's called. Mm -hmm. they are, they're working on some shit right now where donating plasma, which, by the way, you can donate plasma twice a fucking week if you want to, but it's called plasma dilution. It appears that our blood, the portion of our blood that is plasma, it gets cluttered with these misfolded proteins and these fucking terrible shit that actually causes the body to become super inflamed and age faster. So just by donating plasma, like once 
two, two, one or two times a month over the course of six to eight months, you will see changes in your body that you can't believe. You'll feel better. You'll sleep better. And they're working on this. So I did those shows. The first show I did with Arena Convoy was the one that uh, showed that oxytocin is why Trenbolone works so well. So she did this. She did a study that uh, where they took old rodents and young rodents, and they injured them like sticking a, a needle in, in a muscle, and then they watched how fast they healed. And then they took old rodents and young rodents again, and this time they gave the old rodents fairly large doses of oxytocin, and they healed better and faster than the young rodents. Mm -hmm. Then I came upon a study uh, that was done on cattle, and believe me, it works the same way in cattle as it does in humans. And what we discovered was, on that study, was that trenbolone builds muscle so fast and strength so fast because it increases the physiological levels of oxytocin 50-fold. And this is why you lose your cardiovascular. You know, when you do trend, you can't fucking walk up the stairs without huffing. It's because imagine you just nutted. And now you get out of bed and you run up the stairs. How effective would you be? Fuck no, man. <laughs> that, and that's because of the oxytocin flooding through your body after you had the orgasm. So what we discovered was it's the increase in oxytocin that Trenbolone brings on that causes the rapid muscle growth and also the diminishment of cardiovascular conditioning. It raises heart rate too. Uh, anyone who's done Trend knows like your heart rate goes up 30 beats a minute, fat, like overnight. Wow. And that's the same thing when you have an orgasm. Your heart's fucking pounding, right? Okay. So Arena Convoy is really, really brilliant. And her husband, David, is probably too, but she's kind of the lead person there. So then they did the parabiosis research. And then they discovered by doing some other studies that removing plasma and replacing it with synthetically made new plasma, which is just saline and vitamins and, and some minerals, like took people's biological age using what epigenetic chest to ch test, like took them from a biological age of 60 to 30. Oh. And right now there's clinics that are charging $8,000 where you go in twice in a weekend and they pull the plasma out of you and put fake plasma back in, do, do it twice. And like in, in that weekend, you drop 30 years in your, in your biological, uh, in your uh, epigenetic tests, mm -hmm. your chronological versus biological. So then I had her on my show and I said, like, we, we re reproduce plasma like quick, right? She's like, yeah, you could donate plasma twice a week. I says, so wouldn't that like have an advantage? And she says, we're just getting ready to do that study. So I postulated that since the plasma is so dependent on a healthy liver, the thing to do is get your healthy, get your liver healthy, whatever you got to do, uh, you know, re stop doing the drugs or stop the alcohol and get your t tests done on your liver to say, oh yeah, your liver's functioning great. Then go do donate plasma twice a month because your body's going to create really improved plasma and watch what happens to your body. All of her research shows that plasma don't, like, in fact, I think there could be a business where you fucking go to people's house and draw the plasma because nobody wants, you know, you know where, where you give plasma? Where all the alcoholics go to fucking sell plasma to get a, a, a bottle of hooch. That's where they all the plasma centers are. They pay you $50 to donate plasma. You get paid to get fucking younger. Wow. Yes. When you donate blood, they ask you if you want to do like full blood, right? And, and plasma and, and can so, be included, right? Well, they take plasma with full whole blood. Got it. And, and, don't, and don't do the red blood cell thing because you want to get the plasma out too. But blo donating blood twice a year can improve longevity dramatically. There's mm. good studies out there that show that. Mm. But yeah, there's a... Arena Convoy said something on my show that really stuck. Yeah. She said, there's nothing you can do, uh, that, nothing you can take that will improve longevity. It's about what you get rid of from the body. And that speaks to my theory on aging and the metabolic accumulation of debris. What about for injury? What do you think uh, are some of the best peptides for that? Me mechano growth factor, uh, which is also called IGF-1EC, uh, BPC-157. And if you can get real growth hormone, you don't have to do a lot. You just have to inject it close to the area that's injured. And what can someone, uh, like, what can it do? Like, can it help regrow tissue? Fast. Or? So mechano growth factor, uh, we discovered, is a form of IGF that repairs muscle and soft tissue. It's the part of growth hormone that gives you the tissue repair. And so, and BPC-157 is, everybody knows what that is nowadays. It's mm -hmm. a, 
actually produced in the gut. It stands for body protection complex or body protection compound. And it does exactly what it says it does. Uh, it, it, it's like a, it, it's, it's like the job foreman, right? You got bricks, you got mortar, and you got guys here waiting to work, but you need the foreman to say, well, build that wall over there. So BPC does that. And if you have adequate amounts of growth uh, hormone in your body and growth factors, mm -hmm. it will repair shit. Like I, I've helped people, I'm not going to mention any names, but some power lifters who've torn uh, quad muscles right off the bone. And the, guy, and, they, and the guy, and you probably know who he is, and the guy is like fucking squatting more than he squatted before the surgery. Wow. And because he was using, and, and that's where protease enzymes come in as well. To, to speed the healing and recovery of muscle, you need protease enzymes. Because protease enzymes don't just break down the food in your stomach. They break down muscle, so prepare it for turnover. It's like cleaning the, the, the ground before you put the wall on it. So I would say uh, BPC-157, IGF-1 EC, and uh, protease enzymes is a must-have uh, to repair an injury. You mentioned red light therapy a little bit ago. Um, do you do red light therapy? What have you found are the benefits? Because some people understand that there's a lot of research to back it up, but some people still think it's bullshit. Well, it can't be bullshit because red light is about 770 nanometers and it's one of the wavelengths in sun. Mm -hmm. like, like we have fucking listened to these um, dermatologists way too fucking long. Like we evolved under the sun. Guys like you and me, we're darker because we our ancestors spent... All, t all the time in the sun. Yeah. We produce less vitamin D as a result of that. Mm -hmm. So we have to stay in the sun even longer. And I, and I love uh, Milano 10 too, by the way. I know that you, you, we've been talking about that. But the reality is, get out in the fucking sun. Don't be afraid of it. And don't worry about the wrinkles. They're, oh, well, you know, you'll get wrinkled. Fuck that. You'll live longer. Yeah. You know what kind of wrinkles you get when you're in a coffin? <laughs> I mean, do you know, stimulating the Milano Corton system probably provides a lot of the stated benefits that vitamin D does. Like Milano Corton will give you a jacked libido. You, anybody who's ever done Milano 10-2, uh, guys especially, you know, you get an erection in the last three hours. And, and you know, just with, with one makes shot. Makes your skin and everything, like makes everything super sensitive, yeah. including your dick. Yeah, and, 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 but it makes you darker. <laughs> but it all, there's, there's four Milano Corton receptors on every cell. Their whole job is to reduce inflammation. That's why laying in the sun is one of the greatest things you can do to reduce whole body inflammation. Mm. So this idea, like, and, and, and what, what we've done is, well, sun is bad, but this wavelength is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're probably right, but you get that in sun. So don't believe the hype because skin cancer doesn't come from the sun. The sun is an unwilling participant in your skin cancer. And we know that unequivocally. We, we know there is people that, Asses have never seen the sun and they have, a, they have skin cancer on their cheek of their ass. Like, how do you, but where was sun? Where was, it's, it's really about what you eat. What you eat makes its way in every cell of your body, including your skin. We know that taking things like uh, astaxanthin before going to the beach protects you from getting skin, skin cancer. Actually taking retinol before going to the beach will really protect you from getting skin cancer. So how does that work? I take a pill and put it in my mouth. So you're telling me it gets into my skin and protects my skin? Yeah, exactly. So what about when I eat those fucking chemicals in that, that, that you know, that uh, packaged meal I just bought? Mm -hmm. What about the, 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 the dyes? What about, you know, all the bullshit? How do we know that those aren't activated by the sun and switch on oncogenes? We don't. Skin cancer comes from the fucking food you eat. Just the way the book of matches isn't to blame for the fire. The person who lit the fucking curtains on fire is to blame for the fire. Mm. I've done shows on this too. It's, yeah, it's people need to develop a little bit of like a uh, sun callus, right? Yeah. Like a solar callus. Get used to the sun a little yes. bit. Yes, and that's yeah. what Milano 10 2 was created for by scientists at, at Arizona State University. It was to take people that were like a, a number one on the Fitzpatrick scale, like they're almost translucent. You can see their blood, blood tr go trace it through their veins. <laughs> yeah. And they would give them shots of melanotan too, to prepare the to, for sun exposure. And they saw that the changes in, in uh, sun exposure were minimal as opposed to just getting out there and laying in the sun. Mm -hmm. And that's where melanotan 2 was created specifically for, but we can't get anybody to use it because I, I get fucking scary dark. Like, I, 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 Elisa <laughs> tells me, she tells me, you're turning purple. 
Like my skin gets so dark, it starts to look like like that. Yeah, you're dark anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so, but yeah, it's actually the sun is great. The sun is important, and people should be getting more sun. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get lost though by like red light therapy though. You're saying is you know, it's good. It yeah. actually has a beneficial effect on the mitochondria. Um, a better one is near infrared, mm -hmm. which is uh, kind of you can see like a little purple glow in the LED. Uh, that can actually uh, cause increases in nerve growth. Mm. Okay. Uh, when my father w was about 82, he had developed type two diabetes and he developed real bad pain in his hands and his feet. And there's a product made by a company in Colorado. Um, and it was, um, oh God. But they created a 980 nanometer LED pad. Mm -hmm. And that when you use it, the neuropathy goes away in like a month or two because it's, it liberates nitric oxide from the hemoglobin and it feeds neuronal sprouting. So where the nerves got fucking broken off or, or died, it makes them start growing from there again out. Wow. And so 770 and 980 to 990 is magic. It, it stimulates mitochondria. It helps to regrow uh, nerves. It, it improves, uh, it reduces pain. It, it is, it's great stuff. Mm -hmm. But again, you get all that shit when you go to Cabo and lay in the sun. Mm -hmm. And if you're trying to get red light inside from some of these devices, I, I think they need to be pretty strong too, yes. right? Yes, yes. They need to have good wattage and stuff like that. So if they're not, so, so there's lots of them that you sit there and you see red light on your body, but that's not penetrating the, the, the two centimeters that it potentially can, can penetrate. Uh, when you have the stronger light, it really gets in deep. In fact, it can affect your brain. You can put a red light above your head and sit there when you're working and it'll, it'll, have the same beneficial effects on your brain because it can actually get through the bone. And it gets into, and that's the other thing about the sun. The sun has so much power. Mm -hmm. You lay there, your fucking organs are getting hit by that sun. It's going through, unless you're a fat fuck like I was in when I was 39. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you, you, it gets to your organs as well. And we evolved under the sun. Mm -hmm. Like if suns cause skin cancer, we wouldn't have this fucking conversation right now because all humans would be gone. Because <laughs> after 40,000 years of ice age, we went searching for hot, sunny climates. So we would have been, oh, everybody got skin cancer back then and died. Does the sun uh, trigger uh, skin cancer? So, so yes. There are, there like are someone goes out and they get photo, burned? There's photo reactions, yes. So- when you get burnt, it damages DNA in the skin. So protecting the DNA from getting damaged is very important. The way to do that is load up on retinol, vitamin A, real vitamin A, not beta carotene from carrots, real vitamin A before you go in the sun. Mm -hmm. Because there's a couple good studies out there that show that sunlight both depletes uh, retinol in the skin and then low levels of retinol in the skin do show signs of changes in DNA. I know in Australia, they're pretty crazy about the sun and they, you know, everyone's lathered up and they use a lot of sunscreen. And um, there's a lot of information where a lot of those people that develop skin cancer, they have really low vitamin D. Well, but and then you're like, well, but, that, but they're only checking for vitamin D. They probably right. have really low vitamin A, but the problem, right, right, right. the problem, the problem with, I just mean, they're not getting the, yeah. not they're trying to stay away from the sun. Yeah. And that's actually probably the thing that is, uh, perpetuating the skin cancer faster. And there are, there are studies that show the micron size titanium particles in, in uh, sunblock and a lot of these other things are fucking bad for you. They show up in your bloodstream like minutes after you wipe that stuff on you. Mm. And, 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 and again, just like cholesterol, these are all predicated on a false understanding that the sun is bad. You don't want to block the sun. You don't want to block the sun. I mean, maybe you don't want to sit in it as long as another guy, but... And even my grandmother, my grandmother, uh, I, I get my Northern African blood from my, my father's mother, Conceda. And she was so fucking dark. And in the summertime, she'd take all the kids to Coney Island. And she'd lay in the sun all day long. And then she'd go home and cook for my grandfather. Like, I, I, I come from a line of sun worshipers. It feel, I wrote a poem. And I'll send it to Andrew. Uh, I wrote a poem about the sun. Uh, about how... It, like it's a, it feels like an old friend when I close my eyes and, and but now I'm broken. You you can heal me, and and she always takes me back. It's a fucking it's a short little poem, but I, I have had a, a love relationship with the sun since I was a kid. Yeah. So 
again, backing up real quick, instead of people going out using sunscreen, they should use, they should purchase some retinol and use that before they go out in the sun, but also be careful about the time they go out and if they're sensitive, because you can build up your um, ability to handle that, right? Yes. It's like weightlifting. You don't go in the, 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 the gym and, and try to bench press 300 pounds, right? You start out with what you can do. So I would say if you're, if you're, if you're a fun, a sun naive person, mm-hmm. definitely make sure you got enough retinol in your body. 10,000 I use a day oral. It's a common tablet. You could take that. Uh, make sure it's real retinol, retinol palmitate, retinoic acid, not beta carotene or any of the carotenes. Okay. Take that every single day for a couple of weeks at least before you plan on going on vacation. And when you get on vacation, sit out in the sun for you know a half hour, you know, not much longer than that. And then gradually increase the time out in the, in the sun. That's it. It's, it's logic. Because remember, from an evolutionary perspective, we didn't go lay out in the sun because... We fucking toiled and worked out in the sun. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the other thing is, when you sit out in the sun, if you go jump in a shower, you literally wash the vitamin D off that your body just produced. So leave the sweat where it is. Just fucking let it dry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I kind of love this idea of like nature makes no mistakes. Yeah. And the human body makes no mistakes. And just think about like you're outside, it's hot. The sun is like, you know, it's, I don't know, 3 3 p.m., middle of summer. It's like, what do you do? You step into the shade. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's that's the best way to, like, be in the sun. You're still getting all the benefits of the sun. You're just not, it's not directly beating down on you and uh, just wearing you out. Because it can make you tired, it can make you depleted, and so so on. But, but you know, clothing isn't unnecessary in sun. You know, you can, you, you can button up a, a right? light shirt. That's, that's yeah. probably got an SPF of fucking 400. But right. you're still getting sun going, going through the weave. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I wouldn't rub anything. I, I I'm not a big proponent of just uh, willy nilly lathering stuff on my skin because it gets into your fucking blood. Mm. What about blue light? What's that doing to us? I don't know. You know this is so. I I consider myself a critical thinker. Okay, so when you're out on a sunny day, we're talking about this sunny day. Besides the sun, what else do you see? Assuming it's not cloudy out. Blue sky. Fucking a. Yeah, so, the sun <laughs> itself has blue light in it, right? Of course, yeah. it's part of the spectrum. But yeah. the idea, like I have I have a spectrum analyzer that I can point at something. It'll tell me what portion is red, blue. And, uh, and so I go outside in my backyard. I'm laying in the, with my shirt off, getting some sun. I take it. I point it at the sky. I hit it. Most of it is blue. Because the the blue the blue of the of of the uh, the sky is reflecting back down to you. So if blue light is bad for us, then is fucking daytime bad for us? No, I think the idea is that blue light is bad for us at the wrong time. Okay, that and so I wear I, know, I wear and I wear blue blockers at night. I do when same, I watch yeah. TV at, at night. Yeah, and I definitely get to sleep faster too. So yeah. with with that in mind, though, this is what I've just been kind of thinking so like if uh if you have a flashlight and you point it at at a white wall right you're getting blue light reflect reflected back on you right what we get from the moon is a reflection of the sun so aren't we still in essence getting some blue light at night anyways but you're you're absolutely right <laughs> to, to what degree the power I, of the moon is very low okay yeah, yeah. got it yeah, yeah i always no I thought that was fascinating i but, think I, I i like to look at it this way like <clears throat> because I understand there's people that like, oh, that, that's that's bullshit. You know, they, and I get it. Like, I think that makes some sense. The way I look at it is that most of the time when we're on these digital devices, um, we're just, we, we have to admit we're spending too much time on that. Absolutely. And we have to also admit, like, we need to get outside. So, like, whether you want to argue with me about blue light and getting out, you know, this and that, or the... Uh, the EMF or whatever, <laughs> whatever, uh, 5G, right? Like, right. Let's get away from some of that so that you're not distracted by thinking that technology and all this stuff is like microwaving your body. Right. Mm-hmm. But let's just say that it makes sense to get away from our technology a little bit and get yes. some exercise and get outside and go on a walk. And, and when you talk about the blue zones, they don't have, they're not sitting inside looking at their fucking cell phones. Right. They're outside, yeah. you know, talking to a neighbor sitting in a chair and the sun is, you know, again, technology, uh, the environment, the, the, the local environment, the, the pollution, it has a lot to do with damaging uh, our bodies that you just can't go, oh, well, eat like the Okinawans and and and, and have the community uh, like uh, the Italians. That's not going to fucking save your life. You're not going to be able to do that. Not here in the United States. Yeah. 
You said um, something about um, testosterone and prostate cancer. Can we dive into that a little bit more? Yes. Harvard uh, trained physician and scientist, Dr. Samuel Denmead, uh, came on my show the first time, uh, probably five or six years ago, when he published a study where he showed that um, super physiological levels of testosterone reverse prostate cancer. So I read the study and that was, that was a title that attracted a lot of attention. But when you read deeper in and I, and he actually started using this term because of my show, I called it bipolar testosterone therapy because what it was, was they were giving guys like 600 milligrams of testosterone once a month and watching their blood levels to the point where they were like up here and then all the way down here by the end, like a 14 year old girl. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what he realized was it's that pulse that reverses prostate cancer. And that pulse happens organically and naturally uh, in men when they are producing normal levels of testosterone. 6 a.m., you got your all up here. By the time you go to bed, it's down here. And, and it does this on a daily basis. So what he did was he put men on this regimen of testosterone. And I'll send you the study. You know, so you, you can send it to that guy. And so they, they, when he did this dramatic increase in testosterone to this dramatic decrease in testosterone once a month, the aggressive prostate cancers reversed. It's not like the symptoms were away. The, 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 the growth on the prostate went away. So he knew he was onto something. He's done two more studies since then. And thanks to me, he calls it bipolar testosterone therapy now. Mm, wow. Did, is there an amount of time that it, like, average amount of time? I think, I think by... these guys were in the study for two years. Okay. But the bottom line is anybody who's been treated for prostate cancer knows that the, the ADT, uh, androgen deprivation therapy that they put men on, destroys their lives. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I, they die from other diseases related to lack of testosterone. Their blood pressure changes. Their... their their lipids change. Their brain doesn't fucking function right anymore. They become spontaneously diabetic. They always have, when a guy's on ADT, he looks pregnant. He has so much visceral fat that his, his, his gut just bulges out. <laughs> so like you can die from that or you can die from cancer. And they figure, well, if you die from that, you didn't die from the cancer. So you're a success story. Thanks. Let's uh, pause for a minute. We'll just take like a little break because I still want to talk to you a bunch about like gun leash. And I think we all probably still have oh, shit ton of questions, a like, decent a amount lot. of questions. So let's just take a little break and I'm going to use the bathroom and uh, we'll go on a walk or something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Pat Brock's family on the podcast. We talk all the time about feeling good, good habits to make sure that your health is in check. And one of the things that's super important is getting your blood work done because you could be getting great sleep. You could be having great nutrition, uh, but under the hood, there could be things going on that you don't realize. So it's always good to get your blood work checked so you can totally understand what's going on. Now, the thing is also, when you get your blood work checked, there's so many different things and so many different numbers that it's hard to tell what's good, what's bad, and how do I optimize things? And that's where Merrick Health comes in because they have patient care coordinators on staff that can help you interpret your blood work and then give you the necessary recommendations as far as supplementation, nutrition, and if you need it, hormone optimization that'll start moving you in the right direction. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com slash Power Project. At checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the Power Project checkup panel, or any individual lab you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, gun leash. What's going on with gun leash? We got to talk about that for a little bit. You got an amazing invention, I believe. Yeah, I patented it. And it took three years to bring it to market. Uh, this is what it looks like. And what gun leash is, it, it solves a big problem. Every 45 seconds in America, a handgun is lost or stolen. And the ATF just showed uh, from 2017 to 2021, 50 to 70% of the guns used in crime were previously owned by legal gun owners, but then lost or stolen. And we have more lost guns than stolen guns in America. Total about 700,000 700, guns a year. And these are the guns that are falling into criminal hands and being used to commit crimes. So my idea was, what could we do to keep people in, in touch with their guns from keep losing their guns? And so I created this, um, I actually got a patent, worked with a company 
uh, called Midian Electronics, and they produced the, the board. This is the smallest full-functioning Bluetooth beacon around and probably in the world. And <laughs> you attach it to your gun, and it talks to an app on your phone. And if your gun gets 20 to 30 feet away from you, i.e. you walked away from it, the alarm goes off, you go back and get your gun. And the number one place that people leave their gun, public restrooms. Number mm -hmm. two, the dressing rooms at department stores. Number three, you're not gonna, I, I found this one hard to believe, in the booth of a restaurant. Like if you wear oh, a gun wow. inside your waistband, you're sitting there, you're filling up, you're like, oh, you take your fucking gun off, you lay it on the seat. And then when you're all done eating, you mm -hmm. slide out and you leave. And, and, and it's, it's a real big problem. Uh, I, I just came back from the SHOT Show, which is the largest uh, industry show for, for guns and related, to, and, and it's like 30,000 vendors from all over the world. Wow. I met with Swin Smith & Wesson. I met with uh, Beretta, Taurus, Mossberg, uh, Glock, three and four other companies I can't think of. And I, I brought them the board. I showed them this and I said, look, and they all agreed, we know. We know there's a problem. And I, I said to them, like, if we don't police this problem from inside the industry, bureaucrats are going to get involved and start writing laws. It, uh, Louisiana already has one on the books. Mm -hmm. If your gun is used in the commission of a crime and you lost, it was lost or stolen, you'll have to come to court and they're going to try you for negligent complicity, but in other words, you you contributed to this crime yeah. where this guy is getting tried for. And it's going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to, to prove that you took every step you could not to lose your gun. Wow. And so if, we're going to have laws that are going to make gun leash necessary. Mm. And it's on sale right now. The website is gunleash.com. And it's $99 for one if you have one handgun. And that includes one of the beacons and everything you need to attach it to your gun. And then you download the app, and then it's twenty nine dollars a year for the for the app. And we're we're developing things for the app now. We're learning uh, from gun industry experts uh, other things that we need to add to the app. So the app is going to be amazing. Like for instance, uh, I have a friend. He's also an investor. He's a pilot for Southwest, and so just uh, Fort Myers he flies out of. In one year, last year. They confiscated 2,260 handguns. Holy shit. People just show up. Like, if you wear a gun, like I told you a little while, I'm, I'm not used to not having a gun on me. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. just show up at the airport, and you're checking your bag, you go through security, and they're like, gun. And you're like, oh, fuck, I forgot to take my gun off. Wow. <clears throat> they put you on the no-fly list. They arrest you right there on the spot so you don't make your trip. They put you on a no-fly list. $40,000 it costs mm -hmm. for trying to get on a plane with a handgun. I mean, it's fucking, it's amazing. So we're, we're building geofencing into the app right now. We'll have every single airport in the United States. When you get a quarter mile from it and you do have a gun enrolled and active, mm -hmm. it'll say, uh, you know, you're a quarter mile from a, an airport. If you're going to the airport, please stow your gun now. People are like, oh, fuck, I forgot my gun is on me. Uh, there's a girl, a woman in L.A. And she's a businesswoman. And so she had a gun in her purse. She was in a restaurant. She was all finished eating. She's on a phone call. She gets up, she walks out of the restaurant, gets in her car, drives away, gets a couple blocks away and realizes, oh my God, I left my purse. Calls the restaurant, said, I left my purse. They says, yeah, we, we got it right here. She's on my way back. She gets there, LAPD is waiting for her. Abandoning a loaded handgun in a public place is a felony. She got fucking arrested. She's still paying for, for the lawsuit that she has to fight. Uh, she they took they took her pistol permit away from her because she can't carry a gun anymore. Oh my god. Like and there was an accident. It's like LAPD, like, no, you abandoned a loaded handgun in a public place. Yeah. That's against the law. We would keep her from, when she was going out the door on the phone and walked away from the gun, the alarm would have went <clears> oh <throat> shit. My purse and my gun. You know, she would have went back and got it. So it's it's a big problem. You know, it's funny, when I first started going down this rabbit hole three years ago, I had people telling me, do people lose? I don't think people lose their handguns. It's like, let me get this fucking straight. People lose everything. Yeah. Like, but no, but somehow there's this magic <laughs> halo around handguns where you just don't lose them. They don't understand that people take their guns off and forget them. 
Like if you if you're wearing a gun in your car and you're uncomfortable, you take it off and you put it in your glove box, and then you go walk in your house, you're gonna get notified. You left your gun. Oh shit. Because guns are stolen out of cars all the time. Mm-hmm. Kids go out, out to the suburbs, they pull door handles. If the handle opens up, mm-hmm. they get in, they look and they kiss, and if they find your gun, it's gone. And how often do you lose like your phone? You know, you lose track of your phone real easy. Yeah. It's like once you have the habit of having the phone with you all the time, you seem to like you get so used to it. Right. And then sometimes you just you're like, oh shit, you go to tap your pocket and you recognize it's not there. Imagine the same thing and get used to with that your gun, gun. Right. That you're used to that feeling of of wearing it. And then every once in a while you're like, oh shit, where where did I leave it? So actually you're very astute because I theorize, I, I have spoken to people that are police officers. They lose guns. And it seems to me that the people that have been carrying guns the longest have the highest risk of losing them because of proprioception. Like, you don't feel it. You you think it's there. Like, it's a ghost. Yeah. Oh, and, but you fucking left it somewhere. It's amazing. <laughs> what happened? I have a bottle what drop. What was that? Dropping okay. some stuff over there. <laughs> bottle drop. Yeah, I guess you get you get comfortable with it. I mean, people are probably thinking like, well, it's it's a weapon, you know, and and you would would uh, want to be super safe so that you would never think that you would uh, misplace it. But obviously, it is happening with a lot of people. Well, and we're so distracted today, right? Push notifications and cell phone calls and text messages, and we're, we're looking at the the uh, the map on our, our mm-hmm. in our car trying to get direct. It, it's like we're so scattered today. It's mm-hmm. so easy to lose shit. And a gun is something that you should take every step that a responsible person will take not to lose your gun, especially because that gun could lead to someone's death. And then you're paying for it. Yeah. And a lot of people who lose guns, I'm sorry, a lot of people who lose guns don't report it. There's only 11 states that require you to report a lost lost gun. Mm -hmm. Most people don't report it because they're in fucking embarrassed. Like, oh my God, I lost my gun. That's going to lead, that could lead to a death of somebody. Let me erase that from my memory now and act like I didn't, I didn't lose it and just fucking go on about my day. Oh, How did you come up with this idea? Because this is like, it's an amazing idea. I almost lost my gun. Okay. And I've been carrying a gun. Like I carried a gun when I was young in New York. I had a pistol permit mm-hmm. and I, I've, I've been around firearms my whole life. And uh, we were shopping. Lisa and I were at a furniture store and it was during 2020 and we had the stupid mask on. And- I wear my gun inside the waistband appendix, so it's up here, because that's the best place to wear it, really. Mm-hmm. Because if somebody comes out, you can put your hand up, pull your gun, and shoot, right? You don't want it back here. So anyway, um, so when I urinate, I have to take the gun off, because otherwise it'll fall in the urinal, and I put it behind the plumbing. And I had the mask on, you know? <laughs> I had the mask on, but it felt like that. Yeah. And so I did my business. I went out and met her on the floor. We are talking... And we were shopping that whole day. It was rain and mad. And so we did go home in the afternoon because I was soaking wet. We were going to get changed, regroup, and go back out shopping. And I didn't realize I took my gun off when I got home and I changed in the laundry room and I put it on my, the washing machine. But that, that night at 10 o'clock, we were getting undressed. I said to Elisa, where's my gun? Like, I've, I've never not known where my gun is. That's amazing. And so she said, when's the last time you saw it? I said, when I went to the bathroom at that furniture store. So the first thing I did is I called the furniture store. They had their phones forwarded to California. So I couldn't get anybody in the store. So then it's a small suburb called Jefferson Town, a small suburb of Louisville. So I called J-Town PD and I told them. The guy finished my sentence. I says, listen, um, I said, uh, I was at such and such store and I had to use the urinal. Uh, and, and he said, and you left your gun there. Like I, he finished my sentence. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. And then he says... <laughs> We're having a lot of this, especially now we have like another 20 million people that just bought handguns uh, in, in like the past three years. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and so anyway, so he he sends a cop over there, but this was like 10 o'clock in the morning. This 10 o'clock at night. I didn't have any hope. He says, yeah, we don't have a gun here. So he says, uh, I'm going to put you, uh, he says, uh, give me your number. I'm going to have someone call you back from administration. We want to get this in NCIC just in case the gun is used in a crime you, you, you weren't there, you know, you didn't use it. So while I'm waiting for him to call back, all I kept thinking about was some kid's going to get this gun and shoot his baby sister. And my life is over as I know it. I'm going to be, in fact, I was thinking about how I could separate from Elisa because we just bought this beautiful home. I'm like, 
How do, what do I do? What steps do I do not to splash any mud on her? Mm. Like, I, I may have to fucking leave, I, you know, move somewhere, do, do something, but just to separate myself because I don't want her to get s- stuck in this. And uh, that's when I went upstairs to talk to her. And she reminded me we came home and I went down and I found it. So the cop called me back to take the information. I said, you're not going to believe this. I, I, and I told him the story. I found, he says, thank God. He says, good, no problem. And that was it. I woke up the next morning. I thought, because I've been in the communications business when I was in my uh, in the in the 80s yeah. in Las Vegas, mobile telephone paging. I thought maybe I can make a device and have a pager. And then I thought, fuck that! I got a cell phone. I can get, create an app. So I jumped on a patent and created a provisional patent, submitted it. They gave it to me, and then we started to kind of reverse engineer. Like this is what I want. How do we get there? Wow! And that was it. And how is it different than like, um, you know, because like Apple has like their, their Apple Air tag. tag. Air tag. There you go. Yeah. How's it different? And thank you for asking that question because gun owners do not want anything that tracks their gun. <laughs> this is simple Bluetooth proximity. It doesn't track. It doesn't know where it is in the world. There's no GPS. All it is is the beacon is pinging. The app hears it. The ping goes away. The app goes, oh, fuck. The gun isn't here any longer. That's it. Mm. It's simple proximity. It's like a door switch on an alarm. It knows the door's open. It knows, knows the door. That's all it knows. So there's no tracking about it. And the truth is, the 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 AirTag and those devices are way too big to put. The other thing you have to understand is you put this on your gun, you can still shoot your gun. Like, you don't have to take something off. Like, oh, I got to take this off before I shoot. You know, you're dead. Yeah. So it, it, it lives on the gun. It's so small. It fits perfectly. And the conversations we had with Ruger, Smith & Wesson, uh, a company that I love, Taurus, they're out of Brazil. Um, they want to put it on their website now. Like, they're like, you know, we don't have to build this into the gun. We can just put it on the website and sell it to people just the way it is. Wow. And that's fucking, I, I'm all for that. Uh, and the other thing is that I, and I, I talked to Andy about this because she knows about patents. I mean, she wrote mm-hmm. the patent for your guy's product. Yep. Um, I said, we filed our placeholder for international. So now we have what is tantamount to a, a international patent. But once you file your placeholder and you're approved, then any country you want to file, you have to add that. Mm-hmm. And we got we got a, a company in New Zealand that reached out to us and says, we would like to sell this in New Zealand. Wow. So now it's just a matter of stepping forward and, and taking the steps and creating the relationships and moving forward. And I got a great team of advisors. Uh, Bruce Cardenas is one of my advisors. Mm-hmm. Um, he introduced me to Kimber. The Kimber's like, we love this. Well, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, uh, Deanna Cantrell, uh, the retired uh, chief of police of San Luis Obispo, highly decorated. She's on our team. We have an ATF uh, special agent on our team. And we have these people because we want them to tell us how do we move forward best? Because ultimately, I always thought that superhuman radio would be my legacy, that I helped a lot of people improve the quality of their life and, and health. But I think this is really going to be my legacy because we will have a direct effect on saving lives. If we reduce the number of guns that get out there, then we are reducing the number of people that we p- will be killed. And we're going to show you don't have to ban guns to reduce gun crime. Gun Leash is going to prove that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's interesting. You know, you always seem to be like on the front lines of like, you know, it's interesting that there's not something like that that, exists already, right? And I, when I talked to my buddy, Al Fasano, we, we've known each other since we were 14 years old in high school. The first thing he said to me was, call. That's too, that makes too much sense. It's got to, it's got to be out there already. It's amazing. And we did that and they hired a very good patent attorney and she did a thorough search and there's nothing like this. There are other things like um, to track guns when you're shipping them, but mm. that, but we, we don't track. We're not track. We're pro- proximity. Our product keeps you from losing the gun in the first place so you don't have to track it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, it seems like you're somehow always on the front lines of these things. What do you think is, you know, something like in your past or about your personality? Is it some sort of, uh, you have like a big curiosity about you that gets you uh, in some of these situations? I definitely have curiosity, but I I really think the value, and people are going to fucking think I'm lying right now. Um. I think a lot of the LSD I did when I was young allows me to have original thoughts, like taking two things that have nothing to do with each other and seeing where they intersect. I've had this conversation with Ron Penna. 
Um, I had this conversation with Timothy Leary before he passed away. When I lived in Las Vegas in the 80s, he came to UNLV and did a lecture, a cold November night, like no one knew who Timothy Leary was. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so like 16 people showed up. And so we all, he came down off the stage and we sat in the front row and we talked. And then after that, I started sharing some things that happened to me uh, during trips. And he shared with me that uh, doing LSD uh, takes the corpus callosum out of the picture and the right and left hemisphere of the brain can talk directly instead of going through this clearinghouse. That's why when people trip, they, they like, I can smell the color red. That's called synesthesia. That only happens when there have been inroads of nerves between the right and left hemisphere of the brain. And so he told me that, and he told me then, and I didn't, I, didn't, I told him, so I had, I was tripping one night in 106 Street Park, hanging out with my friend, Mike Agresto. And I was sitting on the, in the park. It was like three o'clock in the morning. We were smoking pot. And all of a sudden I had this image of a conical um, television screen, like little, little televisions. And then like this mushroom shaped object and they, they were like inches apart. And, I, and all of a sudden I felt like I could see 360 degrees around myself. I was sitting this way, but I could see behind me. I could see above me. And that's all the trip I had. And, and that was it. Fast forward to about, 1996, 97, I was watching an episode of 60 Minutes and they were talking about this new technology called an optic coupler. And, and it was the drawing was exactly what I saw in my fucking trip. So I told Timothy Leary this story and he said, he said, well, uh, by taking the corpus callosum out of the picture and allowing the right and left hemisphere to communicate directly, you can have original thought. I said, what's original thought? He said, original thought is when you take things that have no relationship and find a relationship. And so I really do believe that uh, the way I think uh, has a lot to do with all the acid I did when I was a kid. <laughs> I mean, I, I know that people probably get think this guy's really a fucking dick. I don't even want to listen anymore. But I'm just telling you, that's that's what I believe. I really do. Yeah, because there's been stuff on your show that, um, you know, people started talking about maybe in the last year or two uh, that was on your show, like a long ass time ago, like uh, Fedosia Agresta yeah. and uh, Methylene Blue and yeah. a bunch of other stuff. I, I I was the first person to talk about Fedosia in 2006. I had Dr. Toyin Yakubu was the scientist from the University of Aloran in Aloran, Nigeria. <laughs> Um, I was like that last name. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and 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 he came on the show. He's the one who did the original research on Fedoja. Wow. I actually know how Fedoja works. I think a lot of the people that talk about give it to us. Fedoja increases testicular cholesterol without changing arthrogenic uh, 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 factors of your body. In other words, it doesn't lead to atherosclerosis. It just increases cholesterol in the testes. Cholesterol is what the Leydig cells use to spit out testosterone. And that's why people who take Fedogia say, I feel like my balls are bigger. Yeah, they are. But the highest doses of, of Fedogia rendered the rodents unable to produce testosterone on their own after that. So what people need to know about Fedogia is always take the lowest dose you can because when you start taking higher doses, it appears that it permanently damages the lytic cells of the, you know, it fucking engorges them. They're like, they're, it's like, it's like, you know, when you you put boost, you put nitric oxide and, and, and turbo, you blow the fucking heads off, you know? Mm. So yeah, that, that's an important factor. But I really think Fedogia is a ideal uh, supplement for, for, for people who don't want to get on testosterone, HRT, and they're older, because it definitely will bump your testosterone production up dramatically. The other thing is when I was working with, um, when I was working with the Toyin, I was trying to help him because this guy's a, a university professor, you know, they're not making a lot of money. And so I introduced him to a couple of companies and uh, they wanted to introduce a Fedogia product. One of them was a Canadian company, but he was like, Carl, Fedogia is a very, very small produced crop. It's produced mostly by medicine men, like that are trying to help guys get their wives pregnant. And he said, uh, we could never produce what they want. But I would imagine someone figured out how to grow it here in the United States by now. I, I'm guessing. 
Let me ask you, what, what would you say is a, a dosage, a, a good minimal dosage of it? Because you mentioned obviously taking a, as little as you can to get benefit. I don't remember, but some, for some reason, uh, 200 milligrams of the uh, Fidogia extract, mm -hmm. which was obviously standardized for the component that Toyin said was the reason that it increased testicular cholesterol. For some reason, 200 milligrams, I remember, I feel like the, 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 Highest doses was 600 milligrams, and they didn't have a good outcome. Ooh, yeah, because I see, I see like one from Momentus right now. It's 600 milligrams per capsule. So I'm like, maybe I don't want to do that. But, I, mm. but, but again, you have to remember now, these were rodents. The original studies okay. came from rodents. Okay, okay. And the original study was in some obscure volume of the uh, uh, Asian Journal of Andrology. Like oh, yeah. Andrew and I were talking about that this morning. <laughs> <laughs> how the fuck do you find this stuff? <laughs> wow. And how do you retain I read, the information? I read, uh, I read a lot of research. I, I'm not a big book guy. You know, I don't, I don't, I, in fact, Aaron Singerman got me to start reading uh, fiction and I fell in love with Vince Flynn and the whole espionage stuff. But then Vince died and <laughs> he stopped reading. But I, I just read studies. Elisa and I, we sit around and we send studies to each other. Wow. That's awesome. Um, speaking of stories and, and reading books, uh, did you ever read the, uh, Jack Reacher series? Mm -mm. I know you're into the show. I love the series. Yeah. And I love it more that this guy is on 600 milligrams of testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty goddamn big. Look, you know what? Um, I understand. In fact, I wish he would just fucking come out and say, look, I'm working with my doctor and I'm taking 600 megs of testosterone a week. That's not 250. That's yeah, not he had HRT. some weird story about That's not how, like, he wasn't on in the first season. And now he's on some stuff. And it's like. Yeah, because he, he was training so much. And, and I do believe this. I mean, you can bottom out your testosterone by being overtrained all the time. And I do believe that. But he seems like a huge guy regardless. Yeah, he know? is a big guy. And, and and I don't know if you remember him. He, he was in a really funny uh, series like uh, about some university. Uh, where he was like a jock. He was, he actually he was on American Idol too. Really? We saw some footage of him uh, singing to like J-Lo <laughs> on American Idol. It was Very really interesting. It was interesting. I mean, the yeah. guy has always had a great physique. He's obviously yeah. trained. He's serious. But I, 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 I really believe, and, and I stand to be corrected, and I'm sorry if I'm, I'm fucking spewing bullshit here, but he, look, a lot of uh, people in the medical industry understand that the early research by Dr. Bashin illustrated that 600 milligrams of testosterone in a man is not a dangerous dose. It doesn't change effects of liver enzymes. And uh, I mean, it'll shrink your testes. You know I mean? that, But that's any test. Do you know if these tests were done like long-term? Like did they, they, did they test it for like, you know, six weeks and then did no, they go back they like and six, test? They were like six months and then there was a washout. Yeah. And, and did they test like years later or anything like no, that? No, no, yeah. no, you can't get that. But, but again, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel Denmead, Denmead, I think he uses 600 milligrams to reverse uh, uh, prostate cancer in right. men. So, these, the, the, you know, this idea that uh, there's uh, an amount of testosterone that's safe, I don't think it's really been explored yet. Because, again, not to sound like a fucking dick, but when I was really using gear, I was doing 1,000 milligrams of test a week, at least 1,000 milligrams of DECA, uh, four to 600 milligrams of trend and anthate, not ACE, because I wasn't going to stick a needle in my it's ass. It's all in the day. same cycle? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and then, and then uh, some orals periodically. And I did that for years. Years. How many years? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, at, least, at least eight to nine years. Wow. Oh. And I was strong as fuck, and I loved it. And I'm not going to apologize for that. Yeah. I used to, you know, I trained with my son one day and he said, I just don't understand it. You just don't look that strong. Because, <laughs> oh. you know, I wasn't like ever a beast and I always had shitty arms. Everybody would always say like, train fucking biceps once in a while. And I just didn't care about it, you know? I just wanted to be strong. I wanted to deadlift heavy. I wanted to squat heavy. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do it often. Um, But uh, I, I loved it. I loved, you know, people are taking Ozempic right now. Yeah. And... It, we don't know the fucking long-term effects of Ozempic. In fact, people are getting uh, gastroparesis, which is the paralyzation of the stomach muscle. By the way, I have a therapy to reverse it. Anybody who's listening to this show, if you know somebody who's gotten gastroparesis from using a GLP-1 agonist, 
by GHRP6 from, can I mention the name of a company? Better not. Yeah, Pro- yeah probably not. Oh, no. maybe not. So, so uh, get real GHRP6 from one of these peptide companies. I don't care who you use. Go through a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yes, go. yes. Go through your doctor. And in fact, if you're a doctor listening to this and you're prescribing Ozempic, you should consider using GHRP6 as part of the protocol so that people once in a while can work, wake up uh, peristalsis. So peristalsis is every 90 minutes, your body moves food down, moves food down, every, you know, and it goes until it comes out your ass. Yeah. Well, uh, GLP-1 agonists, one of the things they do is by incre- increasing gut, uh, decreasing gut motility, you feel s- satiety, but, you know, you, you feel satiated, you're, you're not hungry. Well, the problem is some people, uh, and I don't know what percentage, when they stop the Ozempic, it doesn't go away. And they, they like, they, they're fucked. They can't digest food. They eat a meal and they can't eat till the next day because the food is not moving. And, and that has a bunch of other problems with it too. Like if food doesn't move, the lining of the intestines can be damaged and so on. So that gastroparesis, the, obvi- the opposite of gastroparesis is gastrokinesis the normal peristalsis every 90 minutes. Well, GHRP6 is used to stimulate growth hormone production. GHRP6 is a ghrelin agonist, and it shuts down somatostatin. There are two things that have to happen for your pituitary to pulse growth hormone. You need a growth hormone releasing hormone, like CJC1295 or modified growth factor 1 through 29. That's the gas pedal. But you're not going to get much of a pulse unless you take your foot off the brake. And, and taking a ghrelin agonist takes the foot off the brake because somatostatin is, pro, is pr- produced to stop the pituitary from pulsing. So when you put your foot on the gas and take your foot off the brake, you get a massive pulse of, of growth hormone. You have a growth hormone releasing hormone and a, and a ghrelin agonist or somatostatin, uh, really, uh, uh, something that'll shut down somatostatin. Well, gre- ghrelin has another effect. It stimulates spontaneous hunger. Mm -hmm. And the second effect is it's a gastric prokinetic. It makes peristalsis. Like like if I'm going to, last night when we came over to your house, I had had chicken wings earlier and I wasn't hungry. So I took a, a, I actually took a a shot of GHRP6 and CJC1295. And then I came and had those wonderful fucking fillets. I mean, unbelievable. But that made me hungry and made the food move faster. It speeds up peristalsis. It moves the food through you. In fact, GHRP6 is great for old people because old people don't eat enough protein. It'll make them hungry. Fifth, take it 15, 20 minutes before you want them to eat. They'll fucking eat their fingers. <laughs> so that's the, that's, that's the therapy for, for, for gastroparesis. A gastroprokinetic like GHRP6, 100 to 200 micrograms before a meal, and you will revive peristalsis. Any drawbacks or any like dangers of it? Well, there is some evidence that high doses of uh, a ghrelin agonist like GHRP6 could shut down um, uh, protein synthesis temporarily. Interesting. Well, yeah, because that's part of the whole hunger, ghrelin. Um, um, what's the other one? I can't think of it. Yeah. Leptin. Leptin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's all part of that. Okay. What's the deal with methylene blue? So... Um, I did a show about methylene blue with Bruce and Dr. Bruce Ames, who's famous. He, he invented the uh, carcinogenic uh, uh, re- um, s- tests, what, what's cancer causing, what's not. He also is the guy who invented the APGAR scale that all newborns are compared to, uh, to see like if they, if they have, you know, like a 10 right. or, yeah. yeah. And so um, he wrote a paper, probably 2000. Nine, I would imagine, uh, at, that uh, the best Al- Alzheimer's uh, treatment is methylene blue, but nobody cares about it because it's a hundred year old dye. They used to use methylene blue to dye slides when they looked at them through the, the microscope. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's not patentable. So the, it, the medical orthodoxy just ignored it. And he came on my show and he said that now that we look at nootropics, Methylene blue is a very powerful nootropic, and you don't have to take much of it. Um, you, back then, no one was selling it as a supplement. Uh, it's very messy. 
It makes your bowel movement blue. It makes your urine blue. It makes your fucking tongue blue. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's a very effective MAOI inhibitor. And uh, as a result of that, it increases cognition and memory uh, consolidation. Is this something that people, like, so people can just take this whenever, but do they need to be careful about how much they're no, taking? No, I don't think you have to. And, and again, I don't remember the research really, uh, and Seema, I, I don't want to speak like That's and fair. be wrong, but I just remember I talked about methylene blue before anybody even fucking knew what it was. And in fact, when I talked about it, the only place you could get it was a pet shop because mm. it's used to cure tail rot in guppies. <laughs> so you used to put it in the fish tank and it would fix, wow. the, fix the fucking guppies, yeah. Yeah, and is it a, uh, like, can you just take it orally or is it something you need to Orally, inject? orally, but it should be ca in capsules. I know there's companies that are selling it in, like, eyedroppers. That's what like, I everything's going to fucking turn blue. I mean, it's stain, it's stain your hands. I mean, if it's real methylene blue, it's going to stain everything, including everything that comes out of you. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. See, yeah. I see, like, methylene blue 1% on Amazon, USP grade. Yeah, see, and, and, and obviously... From when I did that first show, they've done a lot more research and they understand like the, the dosages now that are effective and you don't need too much. And maybe maybe stuff doesn't turn blue because you're taking such a low, low dose. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe it turns a, a pretty color of brown purple. <laughs> What's the deal with uh, EMF? I don't think people should worry about EMF as much as they should worry about the soup of radio frequencies we live in. Uh, um, EMF has a very, very short distance in fact, when you want to ch check the EMF radiation of like, like a computer, you got to take your EMF tester and get it right up like next to the computer, right? So it's very short range. I think what's, what people need to be paying attention to more is radio frequencies in general. 2.4 gigahertz is what's used for Bluetooth, but it's also used to cook in the microwave, just a higher dose uh, uh, wattage. Um, and the RF that's around us is changing our microbiome. There's studies on rodents where they put a, a cell phone, one of the old 900 megahertz cell phones underneath the a tank and just left it in this, this standby mode. It did two things. The male rodents lost the ability to produce testosterone, which we have a big problem today with people not being able to get pregnant. I'm not saying that's the only thing. It's one of the contributors. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is it changed the, the diversity of firmicutes to, uh, uh, what's the other one? Firmicutes and bacteriodetes. It changes that. And one of those is associated with obesity. Uh, if you remember what we talked about with the uh, trajectory of, of height uh, with um, antibiotics. Hmm. We did talk about that before. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to make sure I wasn't dreaming. <laughs> that fucking LSD keeps coming back around. <laughs> um, so, firmicutes and bacteriodetes, I don't remember which is which, but one of them extract, extracts more from the food, and one of them causes you to, to get less. So theoretically, instead of eating a half a hamburger, you could eat the whole hamburger, and one of them will give you the whole hamburger value. The other one will give you only a half. And so those lead to leanness and obesity. Uh, and we know that uh, exposure to radio frequencies, uh, especially the higher ones, above like 900 megahertz, when you get into the gigahertz range, mm -hmm. they definitely change the microbiome. And, and, we're, and we're carrying this fucking radiation device all the time. Yeah. You know? So uh, it does do that. And I think people need to be more concerned about radio frequencies than EMF. Because, because if, you, if I drag my feet on the carpet and touch something that's static, that's fucking EMF. Yeah, so, there's electromagnetic fields kind of all over the place. Yeah. And, and if you... I actually did a post on... Uh, Instagram and YouTube a long time ago. I have a spectrum analyzer at home because I'm in this radio frequency world I've been in since, since the 80s. And I showed people, I said, this is the soup of radio frequency we live in. And this was just a small part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. This was like from um, UHF to 2.4 gigs because that, that's what cordless phones and, and cell phones are using. I was like, we live in this. You can't feel it. But it, it, it's incident upon every cell in your body and it's doing something. Don't let people bullshit you and say, oh, it doesn't do anything. You know? Because the changes in our anatomy is slow creep sometimes. We don't realize for generations, oh shit, like that was doing something. Pat Project family, we love beef on this podcast. We talk about it a lot. All right, we love our meat. 
but sometimes eating the same meat all the time can get a little bit boring. That's why we partnered with Good Life Proteins, which also has certified Piedmontese on their website. But sometimes you might just want to eat some chicken or fish or duck. <laughs> duck? Who eats duck? But you can eat duck. That's why if you go to goodlifeproteins.com, you can select their Build-A-Box options and input all the proteins you want. Then you'll select subscribe and save to save money on all of your meat. If you enter code POWERPROJECT at checkout, you can save up to 25% on your subscription. That means you're going to be saving 25% on all of that different meat that's going to be heading to your door. Once again, head to goodlifeproteins.com. You can enter code Power Project and save up to 25%. Links are in the description box below as well as the podcast show notes. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, it's hard, I guess, for people to like figure out like what to do about it. So yeah. what do you think people should do? I mean, like... Uh, some people live next to like towers and shit like this. Like, do you think and that- there, there are certain cancers that are more rampant than people who live right under the fucking towers? I mean, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. What can you do? I don't think you can do anything. Mm. 5G and it, is there any way to like protect yourself against some of this stuff you think or, or is it just awareness and I, just uh, yeah. airplane mode in your phone? And, I know and that melatonin can protect the brain against cellular radiation, but you have a lot of people that don't get enough sleep. Their body isn't producing much melatonin. Maybe they're more prone to the brain tumors that we're seeing, uh, glioblastomas and astrocytomas and shit like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't obsess over it. When I was uh, in my 20s and the 80s living in Las Vegas, I, I invented the first handheld IMTS mobile telephone and sold them. We sold over 4,000 of them in Las Vegas. And, um, but, but like I was exposed to mad radiation. I actually got burnt. Um, we were putting a new folded dipole antenna on top of the Riviera. No, was it the Riv? The, the, it was the um, oh, Imperial Palace. And so we had, we had uh, antennas on a lot of the casinos downtown, downtown mm -hmm. and on Strip. And we were changing an antenna. And this was called a 10 dB folded dipole. And we had uh, a 250, it was a 2,500 watt transmitter going into this antenna. Mm -hmm. And Jack Crowley was my technician at that time. And I was telling him, the antenna is up, key it, transmit. And I was holding one of the dipoles, Ooh. right? And I felt something and I'd let go. And later that night, my hand split. Like, you know when you cook a hot dog too fast? And yeah. Oh. My hand split open. So I told Jack. I said, Jack, well, he goes, oh, it'll go away. Don't worry about it. Put a bandage on it. Don't worry. <laughs> the, the next time we were up at one of the antenna sites, Jack brought a, a fluorescent light tube. You know, one of those four-foot ones. Mm -hmm. He says, watch this. And my other, my partner, John Babcock, was in the radio room. He told John, key the transmitter. And then when he, when he got exactly a quarter of the wavelength from the antenna, the fucking light lit up like it was plugged in. Wow. And that's when I, back then in the 80s, that's when I was like, wow, fucking RF. Like, it, we can't see it, but it's fucking there and it's doing shit. And I thought to myself, well, if it can light a fluorescent light up, what is it going to do to our body? Now, obviously, none of us are living that close to that. But, you know, you can even put a hole in a rock by dripping water on it long enough. Mm -hmm. So I, that's when I really became evident to me that RF was not this innocuous thing to, to not worry about. And as, and look, we're, we're, we're in it more now than ever before. Yeah. 5G goes from 20 gigahertz to 60 gigahertz. Like 2.4 is nothing. When you get into those higher frequencies, the waves are smaller. They can penetrate better. I mean, think about it, 2.4 uh, 2 gig with a, a 250, 300 watt output cooks fucking meat. Now, okay, you're, you're, you're putting microvolts out and like Bluetooth and stuff like that, but we just can't say, oh yeah, I know, uh, 45 will kill a guy, but a 22 won't, you know? Yeah, they, they'll both kill you. Yeah. One, one, you may have to take longer to die, that's all. Let me ask this right now. Are there any supplements that you're using on a daily basis that you think are just generally beneficial? Because obviously there are certain supplements that people take for specific situations. But what do you think are general things that most people could do good with? 
You know, I know that a lot of people come up with black and answers because of their favorite, but I can't say that because we're all different. We all have different issues. True. There's nothing I can say that's good for you because it's good for me. Well, for example, melatonin that you mentioned. I right? love melatonin. I've been taking it for 20 years. So, yeah. Let me ask you this. When it comes to melatonin, what's the dosage that you think would be maybe ideal? Because some people take bigger dosages. I so use like a 300 the, micrograms. Yeah, the, the, clinical, the clinically approved dose is 600 micrograms. And that's enough to to affect sleep. Okay. But um, today, in this world, especially if you're like a fan of intermittent fasting, you know, like I said before, eating cues the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. So if you're fasting and then you have one or two meals late in the day, you, your sleep usually sucks because your body is producing a lot of ghrelin. It's like, fuck you, get up, we're hungry. Like, mm -hmm. do something about this. And so I find that... Um, the time-release melatonin is the best because the oral melatonin only lasts about four hours, no matter what you're taking, three, four milligrams. And so people will say, oh, I take melatonin, but it sucks. I still wake up in the middle of the night. Then get the time, the slow release. Um, there's a couple brands out there. I'm trying to think of their names. Nat Nat Natrol maybe is one of them. Um, uh, what's the other one with the yellow bottle? But they like they have three and five milligrams. Like I take 15 milligrams of time release melatonin, I sleep all fucking night now. That was the, I was taking the regular fast release, and what happens is, the fast release brings up, makes you go to sleep, and then it drops off, and your 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 body doesn't your your uh, pineal gland doesn't kick in right away. It doesn't go oh like anticipating, and so you have this fucking dip, and then it'll start producing a little bit as time and go up. You need something that lasts past that bridge. Is that like 30 minutes before bed or? You should take it. Big mistake. People take melatonin and then play on their phones, even with blue blockers. Mm. Take the melatonin when you're turning the lights out because light will inhibit no matter if it's yellow light. It's, you know. So match you, it up pretty closely to like when you're actually like laying down. Like yes. Gonna go to bed yes. I, that's my recommendation. Now, if you look at the study done by the, the Madonna del Grazi Institute on Menopause in Rome, Italy, and this was probably about at least 15 or 16 years ago, um, they made women take three milligrams of melatonin at, at, sun, at, at, at sundown, mm -hmm. right? And so they probably didn't go right to sleep. They went to sleep eventually. And they actually reversed some of those women from menopause. They actually get, regained their period. Now, that study has never been reproduced so there's a lot of people that say they bullshit. If, it, if we, we should be able to do it over and over again. But that is the only study that I saw that spoke to taking it when, the, when it's getting dark out as opposed to right at bedtime. But, but I, I find that taking it at bedtime, because you'll fall asleep on your own and then the melatonin will kick in and it fucking, and I, you'll get super deep sleep or where you should have it early in the night. And then you don't come out of it that easy because it's still it's still producing uh, an effect for at least six to eight hours. I think it was uh, Dante Trudell. He had some posts a while back. I don't know if you ever saw him, but um, he was uh, saying like to take kind of like massive amounts of it. I, have you ever heard anything about it? So uh, women with fibromyalgia can buy a melatonin suppository with 500 milligrams of, of melatonin in it. Jesus. It affects wow. pain. Well, melatonin is... Um, very powerful antioxidant. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's benefits besides its ability to create sleep onset. And people who have really big um, infl inflammation and oxidative stress issues, they can get by with taking melatonin to fix that. I don't know, like the most I've ever taken is 50 milligrams. And the next day I was shot. Like I felt fucking groggy for hours in the morning. That makes sense. Yeah. And I don't even know, it's funny. I've just been thinking about doing some research on what metabolites are downstream from melatonin. Like we don't, we focus on, like let's look, serotonin feeds melatonin. So we know that melatonin is a downstream metabolite of serotonin, right? Okay. What's the fucking downstream metabolite of melatonin? Nobody studies that because mm -hmm. all we do is focus on melatonin. Like are those metabolites good? Are they, I'm sure, and I'm sure they are because we produce melatonin naturally. Mm -hmm. Um, but what are those downstream metabolites? And what do they do? And can we leverage that? Like now we know that produces this. If I take this in the morning, it'll work great with, the, you know, like- It's probably like NAC or NAD. DHEA. Or DHEA, like DHEA 
is the antithesis of melatonin. So when, mm. your, when your adrenal glands wake up in the morning and they start producing cortisol, they, they start producing DHEA. So DHEA inhibits the production of melatonin, according to studies that I read a long time ago. So maybe you should like wake up and take DHEA right away. If you're going to supplement with one, maybe supplement with the other. There's probably mm. a relationship to like melanin as well and yeah. getting sunlight and so Oh, forth, definitely. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, now you're talking about the super cosmetic nuclei and you're talking about the, its relationship to the time of day. Absolutely. And it's true. You get out in the morning and look at the sun or just look at the fucking sky, even if it's cloudy. It, it, there's, a, there's a peptide that a lot of people thought was going to solve their problems with sleep. It's called deep sleep inducing peptide, DSIP. And all of the people who thought they knew what they're talking about told people to take DSIP a half hour before bed. And inevitably, the reason you've never heard of DSIP, I'm guessing, is because it sucks. If you take it right before bed, it fucking wrecks your sleep. And people are like, this sucks. Like, this doesn't work. What I discovered was DSIP is produced in the morning to morning sunlight and daylight. So I recommended to people, take your DSIP first thing in the morning and fucking they all came back and said, man, it's amazing. I had a great night's sleep last night. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I wonder about almost uh, taking uh, uh, taking what you were saying just way earlier. You know, if you if you were to take it like you're saying, like take it right before bed. But I wonder if someone took large dosages because you said you felt like shit at 50 milligrams. Right? Yeah. I wonder if you took it, you know, two hours before bed. Yeah, but you, uh, th there was even a study that showed that uh, improved melatonin. I mean, uh, 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 yes, improved melatonin levels before a workout uh, created uh, a greater ability to train longer. I forget mm. what that, it was an old study. I'm not recommended that. And people started taking melatonin before work. I fuck that. <laughs> like, I don't want to have a bar on my back and get sleepy. You know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's really amazing. The human body is so malleable and so adaptable uh, that we do these studies and we're like, oh, this is how it works. And then two years later, we're like, well, this ha this is how it works. Well, it can't be both. Well, yes, it can. It really can. So anyway. what about magnesium or something like that? Like I take it before bed. It definitely is a, uh, it relaxes the body. It's a, it, it's part of the neurotransmitter in inhibition system. Specific so, one, like three and eight or. I, I take, I, I'd have to plug a pro product. I don't No, that's fine. I, I, I take bioptimizers, uh, magnesium breakthrough because it's got every form oh, of magnesium. The same one. Yeah. 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 As the a only, flavored one, it's pretty good, uh, like a powder and yeah. it has capsules yeah. as well. The only thing I would ask them to change is get the B6 out of it. Mm. We get way too much B6. Way too much B6. Um, I think that B6, everything is fortified with B6 and people think, they say, well, B vitamins are water soluble. What the fuck does that mean? It just means that they'll dissolve in water. Like B6 has a fucking... I'm trying to think, I don't want to, either a six or eight day half-life. Mm. So like the, the, the doses of B6 that start to cause neuropathy and a lot of other problems are like, um, if you take a, a thousand milligrams a day for some period of time, well, if you take uh, 500 milligrams a day, which you're getting, uh, you know, 200 in your energy drink, uh, your fortified bread, everything's fortified with B6. We we end up accumulating B6. I really think there's a B6 problem out there that no one's discovered yet. I think a lot of people have a B6 overload and don't know because no one's paying attention to B6. And the doctors don't pull B6 fucking, you know. Right. I mean, B12 has a shorter half-life. B6 has a longer, it may be longer, maybe 23 days. But anyway. Wow. Is there any vitamins or minerals you think people are missing? Like we just mentioned magnesium. What about like copper or zinc or... Some of these offbeat things, you think uh, maybe people aren't getting as much of it as we used to, or something like that. And there's need to. You know, I don't. I don't know that though. That you know, the whole depletion of the minerals yeah. in the soil and shit like that. I mean, I, it's possible. I'm not going to speak either way, but I, I really think that um, the way your brother likes to eat is the way I like to eat. Like I'm, I'm carnivore, and the way, really, the way you like to eat too. I'm carnivore. Like 80 percent of the food I'm eating is is beef or pork or chicken or fish or you know something like that, eggs. But I think that it's important to have some go-to vegetable that you like. 
You know what I mean? Like I like broccoli. I love broccoli with uh, steamed with olive oil. Okay. And and I and I know Dr. Baker. He's great. Dr. Sean Baker is going to change the fucking world and went through nutrition. I really mean that. I mean, what he's done is he's organized and collected data that he can point at wherever everybody else is like, you know, his first website was called N equals many. He was asking people to eat carnivore and mail and, and send in their blood work. Like he was fucking brilliant. Wow. Um, but, but I think if you're eating a lot of animal and you could have a little, like I like pineapple as because of the, the, uh, uh, enzymes in it. You know, I think a little bit like that, that keeps you safe. That keeps you out of being, well, wow, you have no copper. You know, I mean, there's a lot of copper in in in, in uh, food that grows out of the ground. But then again, the animals that eat it, it incorporates into their flesh. So mm. I'm not a big fan for like multivitamins. I wouldn't take a B, B vitamin. Uh, I, I think it, if if you're not one of these people who's dieting and trying to eat just 1,200 calories a day, yeah, you're going to get in trouble. You're not going to get everything you need. Yeah. And I don't think the... RDA of 2,200 calories a day means anything. It's bullshit. Like, where'd they fucking come up with that number? But I really think that if you're eating a lot of animal, you're getting a lot of what you need because the animals eat it and it's in their flesh. And now we know there's even polyphenols in fucking cow and, and beef. Like, you don't have to eat fucking vegetables to get polyphenols. You can fucking just eat beef. <laughs> so, you know, I think that that's, that's the answer. What really? you got going on over there, Andrew? Uh, yeah, just the uh, when we were talking about like the the RF and the and then EMF and stuff like that. Uh, as we were, you know, we took a we took a lap around the block. But you're saying that you don't really think there's any benefit to grounding. And I've seen a lot of people claim that there is. Of course, with when you have something to sell, you'll find excuses for it. But I'm curious for your thoughts on uh, on grounding. So I have seen grounding do some amazing things. I have seen. Uh, we were at Quest. And Ron, they had a dark field microscope and they took blood samples of people before grounding and after grounding. And there's one effect called the Rouleau effect where red blood cells stack up like casino chips and they can't carry as much oxygen because you have these surfaces that are touching. So okay. um, I, that was pretty cool. I got, wow, what's the value of that? Uh, I don't think there's any value in like clotting factors or something like that. But in my personal experience, especially in the radio business. You know, when we used to have to, have, when we had crystal controlled radios, we had to tune them. We had to get in a, 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 a copper room. Crystal controlled radios. Yeah, before synthetic. Everything's synthesized now. Chip, chip. You okay. Know. okay. So we had to get in this, this room that was made out of like copper screen so that the RF wouldn't get in to where we were. However, we had to have something called a, a sink. And it was basically a bucket of motor oil with a um, with an antenna attached to it that was connected to the copper room because the copper room was still getting hit with all the radio frequencies. It just wasn't getting through and it had to go somewhere. And so it used to go into this sink of, uh, 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 of, of uh, motor oil. That fucking thing used to be hot at the end of the day. Because all that RF that was hitting that screen room was being sucked down into that into that sink. So I, I'm concerned, and no one has done this, and I could do it because I literally have the equipment, and maybe I will do it and send you guys the results. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I'll do this. But what I'm concerned about is some of these uh, grounding devices, sheets, pillowcases, bed covers, they're acting as antennas. I mean, if you have a frequency that is four, four feet tall, like a VHF frequency, okay. then an antenna can be one. It could be a quarter wavelength. So if you have a strand of silver in that, and there's a frequency that goes, oh, that, that's my fit. I'm going in there like a key in a lock. Where is that being dissipated? So they'll say, well, it's being taken down into the ground. But do we know, has anyone taken a spectrum analyzer and put it underneath the sheet and see what frequencies are actually getting through. Because all they're talking about is grounding, but they're not talking about any accumulated RF that could be hitting that and that thing acting like an antenna. And is it all going down into the ground or is some of it residually coming through the others? I, I, it, it's, it's sketchy. If I didn't have the background I have and mm -hmm. working with radios, I, I would not be thinking this way, but I know 
Like that fucking thing used to get super hot. Why? And what what is happening to the residual RF that is coming in contact with that uh, sheet, the grounding pillowcase? Is it all just really going down the ground or is some residual that's that's actually being a, accumulated to you? Mm -hmm. I, I would like to see that research done. I would like to see those studies done. So before people try to get those grounding mats and pads, they need and they're to they're fucking think. expensive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the, the one that covers the the mattress, it's like fucking $4,000 because it's silver. <laughs> it's all silver thread. I mean, they're not cheap. Yeah. But I, if you're going to fool with it, I would just get a, a grounding. If you can prove to me that there is no residual RF accumulation getting to the person, I would say all you need is a grounding pillowcase. Okay. Yeah, then you were able to prove that um, just taking a shower is yeah. going to ground you. Yeah, because I, I took I took a, a, a volt ohm meter, easy to come by, mm -hmm. and I stuck one end in the ground side of an electrical outlet, and the other end I put it in the stream of my shower, and it went to ground. So when people shower in the morning, they're grounding because the water coming into their home somewhere is touching the earth yeah. in a metal pipe or in a, in a tower where it's stored and there's metal in there. So that's that's basically a ground, and the water is grounding. Mm -hmm. So just taking a shower is grounding. Maybe that's why people feel so good after a shower. But not only the stimulation and the the release of beta endorphins from the skin, but maybe it's the grounding too. Who knows? Mm. Well, since you know so much about so many things, we were just talking about showers. What are your thoughts on people's overuse of soap? Do you think it's a it matters to the the bacteria on the skin, or it's not a big deal? I, I think it does matter, but what are the implications, really? I mean, I think it could change the, the bacteria on your skin and the type of soap that you use. Mm -hmm. But but is it going to cause a disease? If, I mean, if you have a skin problem, I would definitely look at it. But yeah. if your skin is not in trouble, I wouldn't even worry about it. And by you don't the worry way, about using soap? No. Mm -hmm. I, I like tallow. Look, mm. they make soap. What They saponify uh, fat. Right? It mm -hmm. could be olive oil. It could be anything. It's also beef tallow. So the saponification just makes it sudsy. But I, I just use tallow. In fact, this is going to sound crazy, but my mother was a fan of lard as a skin cream. Mm -hmm. and, and now that I understand how similar we are to pigs, it makes a lot of sense. More sense than, than, than the tallow. Wow. Because... We, pigs and humans share amazing anatomy. Amazing. That's why thyroid hormone is made from pig thyroid, por porcine thyroid. We take thyroid hormone. Mm -hmm. And um, when they do a, when they, back in the day, when they used to do heart transplants, they used to use a pig heart. And pig stomachs uh, have the same problems as human stomachs when they're exposed to things that cause ulceration. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very similar to pigs. And my mother was a genius. Who knew? She what about was, uh, eating some of these things? Do you think that is uh, impactful at all? Like uh, eating uh, thyroid or liver yes. or kidney or yes. heart? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, we knew that the organs and the, and the, and, and, and the um, glands were very important. The glandulars were very popular back in the day when guys like Vince Gironda were teaching people mm -hmm. how to eat and how to train. Yeah. and, and But the problem is when you buy... Um, when you buy uh, uh, some sort of uh, thyroid, pig thyroid, porcine thyroid, you could buy it, right? You could buy it over the counter. The, the, the T3, T4, T2, it's all been removed. It's mm -hmm. been molecular sieved. They wash it and they, they literally remove the thyroid hormone. So you're just taking a desiccated uh, form of, of pig thyroid. It's not going to change. It's not going to help your thyroid. It's not going to produce thyroid hormone. Um, you'd have to get... For, for instance, I talked about this on my show. Um, I, I know a guy who's a pig farmer, real nice guy. I said, what do you do with the thymus gland? He said, oh, we throw it away. And that's called sweetbreads. Back in the day, if you ever heard somebody ordering sweetbreads at a really good restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, that was sh sheep thyroid. But since pigs are so much like us, if someone out there is a pig farmer and would start to desiccate the uh, the sweetbreads, the thymus, now you have fucking thymus and beta-4, thymus and alpha-1. You have all the thymic hormones in a capsule. You could take it. And, and I think you and I talked about this once before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we did. 
I mean, that that would be huge because now you have all, all the different thymic hormones, not just the selected ones that we want to play with because we have peptides now, mm -hmm. like in a capsule. And imagine what that'll do. Um, there, there was one study that showed that um, get, supplementing with a thymus and beta-4 in the last trimester of a woman makes the brain bigger of the child. Now, and, and there is a direct correlation between the size of the brain and intelligence. That's a fucking fact. Now, are you going to start injecting women with thymus and beta-4? No. Yes. But, but, <laughs> no, but, 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 but could they take a, a, a thymic hormone supplement or cook sweetbreads and eat them? Shit. And, you know, cooking sweetbreads is... Uh, is 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 a process because you have to soak them in butter first. Oh no, milk. I'm sorry, soak them in milk uh, because it has like a gamey taste to it, mm. and then then you prepare it. Uh, but you could easily make thymic hormone capsules out of desiccated sweetbread, that, that that desiccated pig thyroid, that would really look very similar to our thymic hormones. So do you think there is a little likeness, like? Uh you know, the liver king. <laughs> I knew it. Pointed this out like a long time ago. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, liver can heal liver, heart can heal yeah, heart yeah, in no, some I, way? So. Like CoQ10, doesn't that come from the heart? Yes. but And then but, it's supposed to be recommended to the, for people that have heart issues, right? Well, no, no, or people who are taking statin drugs because the statin drugs I see. deplete it. Um, the whole concept of like uh, improves like, which was something that Geronda talked about. Um, is, is, is a stretch. And I'll tell you why I say that. So when, when you eat collagen, uh, type one, type two, it's broken down to its component amino acids. And then it stands ready to be re reassembled by your body when it needs collagen. If it has a little vitamin C, it'll help reassemble it. So your body doesn't know it's liver once it's broken down. It just knows it's these amino acids. So Unless I saw some really strong research that shows like a guy had cirrhosis of the liver or he had some sort of liver disorder and they gave him fucking liver tabs and he was like cured. It's a real stretch because the body- What about like collagen though? Collagen itself. Like yeah. where's collagen come from? Well, collagen comes from meat. Tough steak. Like like, like if you want collagen, buy the fucking cube steaks for $1.60. And it kind of comes from like the skin, right? Well, yeah, the skin, the soft tissue. And then it's associated with- <laughs> improving the quality of skin. Right. Yeah, but but what I'm saying is it doesn't it, it doesn't go into your body as the skin. It, it breaks down to all of its component amino acids first. And then the body looks to repair shit and it goes in its toolbox and goes, oh, we've got all the amino acids. We can build type one collagen now. And that that's been shown. So it's more of an association to like the amino acid profile yeah. and stuff like that, yeah. probably. Yeah, or the that availability of amino acid. And the reason it's, you know, there's another thing that needs to be talked about. So we think of mTOR about building muscle, right? Protein synthesis. But what people don't understand is that mTOR is responsible for consolidating and assembling memories. And there's a study that just came out that shows that uh, poor cognitive function in elderly people is correlated with low circulating amino acid pools, especially essential amino acids. So old people don't like to eat protein. It's tough. They can't chew it. They don't digest it anymore. So they don't eat it. And that contributes to the inability to create memories. Uh, there, there is uh, the endoplasmic reticulum is like a telegraph office. And and it assembles these strands of amino acids that are messages, mm -hmm. cellular messages. So think about if you're typing a message and you don't have the letter C. You can't use, you can't make a word like call. It's going to say all me. Oh, that doesn't make sense. So these, so these amino acids have to be in our body. They have to, because in order for the cellular messages to happen, we have to have the ability to assemble words in a specific syntax so it makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there's a real emphasis, and this is why it's so important to eat complete um, uh, proteins, like you have in your 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 uh, protein powders. You know, yeah. Steak shake, yep. <clears throat> because if you are a vegan and you're eating, you know, and, and most vegans eat processed foods, first of all, let's be honest, you know, it's a hot pocket, it's great, <laughs> it has no meat in it, no animals died, I'm going to eat it. But if, if, if your diet is devoid of glycine, 
Well, when you assemble one of these cellular messages and glycine isn't in it, it doesn't fucking get the message. The, the body doesn't get the message. Mm. So we need to have all these amino acids to produce uh, collagen and all this other shit, but more so because they are like, like growth hormone, 191 amino acids. They're assembled in a, a certain order, syntax. They have bonds that are weak or strong. That's like per, com commas and periods. That shit has to come out exactly right. And when you are eating these these uh, diets that are devoid of all the proteins you need, you're fucking up a lot more than just build, not building muscle. A lot more. Yeah. Uh, how about, because um, we were talking about a little bit about artificial sweeteners and you had mentioned um, as aspartame. aspartame. Um, I had just, you know, I said like, well, will we ever actually know that that's correlated to, or that's, you know, connected to cancer and stuff? And you said that there were some studies that were actually showing that it can. Not cancer. Oh, not okay. Can, uh, the, the, it's, 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 it's correlated with um, neurotoxicity in the brain. Hmm. Uh, there are some studies that show that too much aspartame can actually agitate people. So if you have like an ADHD kid and he loves this candy, and it's got a lot of aspartame and it. it may blow blow him out of fucking proportion. It may, may, may be even more so agitated. But I, I, I find it interesting that we have to argue about not to use artificial shit. I, I you know, and I, I, I and um, I, I love Lane Norton. I knew it. No, 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 no. I gotta, I gotta be, look, I, I'm the first <laughs> podcast that ever had him on the show. Yeah. When he was in Don Lehman's uh, 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 class up in, yeah. yeah. Mm. And I, I love Lane. I, I love his fuck you attitude and I love all, and it's great entertainment. But the idea that we need to have an argument about why artificial sheet, shit should be eliminated to the, the best degree, it's, it's just silly. It's like, yeah, there's a lot of people who smoke cigarettes and they don't get cancer. But should you smoke cigarettes? Are you that guy? Are you that gal? Like, fuck it. Why even try? Why, you know? Yeah. So it's a great perspective. Again, he would not gonna argue for him, but he would always link back to the study oh, saying yeah. they're not, you know, they're not dangerous. But you're what you're saying is we need to look past what studies say about that right now. So the green, the blue zones, like if they looked and see, well, how much artificial sweetener these people use? None. Oh, that's bullshit. There's studies that say it's like, who fucking cares? I don't want to argue with you because you have a study. Yeah. I'm just saying, I don't think, you know, I, I mean, like your wife, she keeps track of how much sugar alcohol she has in a day. Yo, really? Yeah. Whoa. And I, I think that's fucking brilliant. It's like, great. Because, it, because you can actually, since you have a starting point, you could like dial it down and go, holy shit, since I dialed it down, I, I'm not doing this anymore. I don't feel this way anymore. And in the end of the day, the study doesn't matter if it the way it affects you, it differs. Mm -hmm. It's like if 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 you're allergic to something, but there's a study that says people shouldn't be allergic to it, you're gonna keep eating it and fucking dealing with your allergy? No, of course not. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> so we have to be careful because remember the medical orthodoxy is all about lumping us into a group. Yeah. So they can sell a product to all of us. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I and at the end of the day. I've always said when what I know to be true differs with what a study is saying, I go with what I know to be true. Because at the end of the day, if I fucking kill myself, I want it to be my fucking fault and not somebody else's fault. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually Ron Penna when we hung out with him in at his office and he had like given us like Coke Zero and some Diet Cokes. And I remember at the time I didn't know any better, but... I was like, that's interesting. And, you know, he would say stuff like, you know, you should try to have as many artificial sweeteners as possible. <laughs> I think it was more like in uh, regards to like calorie restriction, yeah, I think. Yeah, yes, yes. But that was what set me off. And I'm like, okay. And then now I'm starting to pick and choose my, you know, person that's uh, going to tell me like, no, it's actually fine. Like, because I think Lane will say like the, the studies that they did were on cells in a Petri dish. And because our whole organism isn't, on a Petri dish, then that study he's, was kind he's of, right. you know. Because so, there's studies that'll show gasoline will fucking kill cancer in a Petri dish, but you can't fucking drink it and kill mm -hmm. cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, mm -hmm. he's right. Yeah, I think Ron's point too was that uh, anything you could do to try to keep your body weight. That's it. You know, keep your yeah. body weight in check. Yes. And then once your body weight's in check though, is it a good idea to get rid of shit that's artificial? Sure. 
Or, great. That's or, a great or, idea. Or keep using it if it doesn't affect, if you don't have any, like if you're a person who has a, a, a question, like this, this isn't right. I don't know why I feel this way. Then you have to start eliminating shit to find out what it is. And you may find out that it has nothing to do with artificial sweetening. Then fucking go, go whole hog mm -hmm. on it. Do it. But it, it, the thing is, is I think it is good to be mindful about these things. Yes. Because a lot of people, especially in within fitness, they'll look at something like a Coke Zero, Diet Coke, you know, sugar-free sodas or whatever. Um, and they'll be like, well, you know what? There's no calories. So they'll drink like eight a day. And it's just a consistent thing because it's, it, it's no calories. I'm not gaining weight. Right. Long term, we don't know how that. We don't know. Maybe nothing will happen. And we're gonna, and we're never gonna know because let's be honest. Uh, you know, <laughs> okay. science is is designed. These studies are designed to look at endpoints, and if we achieve the endpoint, then we're good. Um, the endpoint for cholesterol medications was: does it lower cholesterol? The answer is yes. However, does lowering cholesterol really mean anything? And now we're learning no. We we know some of Sean Baker's studies. He's talking about the the uh, Oreo uh, cookie study. And yeah, stuff. yeah, that that was great. The Oreo, but also the the lean hyper responders. Yeah, you know, like they have no plaque. They have fucking LDL at six hundred. It's like by all stretch of imagination, these people should be fucking dying of heart attacks every day. Mm -hmm. And they have no cholesterol. Uh, they have no plaque. So in the end of the day, look, and that's why I like metabolomics. That that area of science where you. You feed somebody something, mm -hmm. and then you watch what happens. As opposed to looking for an endpoint, you just watch what happens. And it, it's more like you, you shoot a bottle rocket up in the air, and it explodes, and you follow all of the streams out and see, well, that, those went there, and that, that, those two turned blue. As, instead of saying, well, let's do this bottle rocket, and let's just watch the red ones. It's like all this other shit of importance is going on, but we're just looking at this over here. Mm -hmm. And we really don't know that that over there is meaningful. So it, it's, it's hard. You know, I started doing this show 18 years ago. And I believed that every study was going to give me some, some answer for something. And the truth of the matter is I've been let down by, by science because it changes. It changes by what we know. It changes what we've learned. It changes by what we thought it was going to do. It changes. It's fucking changing all the time. That's why it's called practicing medicine. Mm. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're practicing, we're trying to get it right. And it's not, back in the day, we were giving people fucking mercury to cure syphilis. We don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Someday they're going to look back at us a hundred years from now and go, could you believe those fucking people did this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. With, with just with the, uh, again, just going back, cause it's something I'm going to start transitioning out of, which is like the Coke zeros and stuff, because I was just thinking about it. Like drinking water is like jumping off of one step. Drinking a Coke zero is like being on a fucking roller coaster. How is it that they both have the same caloric like cost? Like it doesn't make sense, right? right? One has all kinds of shit. One has nothing, but they're both zero calorie. They are not identical. Like what is going on in this thing? It's not, I mean, it's artificial sweeteners, right? But there's some chemical fucking science experiment going on in this can that I do love. Like I do enjoy it's drinking. Right. It tastes incredible. But if I'm just being honest, I'm like, that's just, that just doesn't seem right. It's very unnatural. And you know, there's no, what is it? Uh, something about like no biological free lunch or something, whatever, yeah. however that saying goes. And I'm just like, yeah, like I, I don't want my son drinking that. Like I do feel like, oh yeah, this is great. Zero calories. There's nothing wrong with it. Ron Penna said I should drink some. Like, but if my son wants some, I'm like, oh, you know what, kiddo? Like, I don't think you should be drinking this. But it also, what really need to ask yourself is what is the value of a, a sugar-free product to you? So if you're somebody who's trying to lose weight and and being overweight to that degree is putting your health at risk. So what, which is worse, mm -hmm. having the diet soda or being a fat fuck for, the, for another fucking 10 years? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. you're at the 60th floor. You're going to hit the ground eventually. So it's all, about, it's all about weighing the effects of things. Mm -hmm. Like I love, I love allulose. I think allulose is great because it is a, it's a natural type of sugar. It doesn't really impact us the way sugar does. It doesn't spike insulin. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And you, you need some sweet in your, in your life once in a while. So mm -hmm. Might make you fart here and there. Yeah, and they're fun. They smell good. Yeah. Is that the one that you just like pee right out? Or is no. that? No. No, allulose is uh, just in a bunch of like, bunch of different products, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I think it's a go-to sweetener. And to be honest with you, 
I mean, if it wasn't for Ron Penna adapting Allulose to at Quest, mm. no one would be using it today. Yeah. But now that they he started using it at Quest and he uses it in legendary foods, everybody's like, oh, we got to use that too. Mm. Mm-hmm. Where can people find you? Uh, two places, uh, because I am going to start doing a couple shows here and there. So nice. superhumanradio.net is the website for the podcast. And gunleash.com, if you uh, have a gun and you want to make sure you don't become one of the contributors to gun crimes. And also, we're still looking for investors. There's still an opportunity to invest in, in gun lease. So if you could reach out to me at the website as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carl. I love you. Thank, uh, I love so, you too, Mark. That's Get what I wanted best. to talk about really quick. Oh, what you said ab- about, about love and, and you know, you, you're, you're told your, your son how important it is to love. And I just think, I don't know, there's like a really, really cool story what you told your son, but also like, yeah, I think love is very important. So can you please retell that story? So love is an action word and love rewards the person doing the loving. Like, you know, you have lots of fans and they love you guys, but you don't feel that. But what you do feel is when you look at someone you love and you acknowledge their love, you feel it. Your pulse changes and your heart changes and everything. And so I told my son, actually what I told him was love recklessly. If you meet somebody that you fall in love with, Love them with, you know, jump in with both feet. And if you get your heart broken, don't feel bad. Because anytime you get your heart broken and you really love somebody, your ability to love becomes greater and deeper next time. It's like it's like you bench 300, someday you'll bench 315, you know, you, you just keep working at it. But I said, but don't ever not love somebody because you loving them is what rewards you. Mm. It makes you better, it makes you stronger, it makes you happier. And, and that's been, that, I mean, I, that's a result of my own life, I think. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. Yo, we learned so much from this episode with Carl and Orr, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. We did talk about the Oreo cookie study mm. and dieting on carnivore. And if you want to learn more about that, check out this episode here with Sean Baker, where we figure out if LDL cholesterol is really that big of a deal. So check this episode out.